Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody to our little group tonight. Glad to see all of our guests tonight. Tonight's debate is with Jesus a Communist, Justin Tucker, Executive Director of the Libertarian Party of Illinois, versus Reverend Charlie Earp of the Church of the Revolution. <laughs> there are two rules in the College of Complexes. One is no personal attacks. The other is one fool at a time. While the speaker is speaking and the debate is heading on, I'd like everybody to mute during that time. But, uh, you know, like I said, we will have, uh, after our debate, we'll have a question and answer period. After that, we'll be followed by our infamous rebuttal period. We generally wrap up about nine o'clock, but, uh, you know, if, if it's not, if our two speakers are willing to go on for a little longer, we will. And generally after we shut down, we uh, usually will go on. Okay. The, the thing is, Charlie, if you want to go ahead and uh, start your announcements. Okay. Uh, welcome. Wham. All right. So with that um, and the announcements just being said, uh, if uh, Justin and Reverend Charlie Earp, if you're ready, so am I. And let's get started. Who's going first? I don't Do we care. Have do we have someone? Do we have someone moderating and timekeeping and that sort of that's thing? That's exact. That's what I. That's what I've been doing. We'll be timekeeping. We're gonna be. Uh, okay. All right. And I think Charlie, what was the timer time on it? Charlie. Ten minutes. We have two rounds of, of ten, ten minutes. minutes, and then possibly one or two questions, beginning with questions by the debaters of each other. So okay. two rounds, up to ten minutes each. Okay, I've got a clock on my getting a clock started now. <laughs> Any preference who wants to go first or not? If not, I'll flip a random coin. I'll, I'll let I'll let Reverend R pick. <laughs> okay, Reverend Charlie Earp, you go first then. All right. Uh I'll start and here. I don't know. I I I, I all right. Um Ten minutes you know what? I don't I don't mind going first, even though um I don't really know the form of argument that um, Justin will be bringing, but I'll, I'm, I'm happy to go first because I've done this a few times. So, but 10 minutes is a bit of a challenge. I usually take longer than that. <laughs> Just learn, learn your, learn your. Uh, Let me know when your clock is running. It will be in just a second here. Well, we may run over if you need it. If we need to run over a little bit, we can. I mean, it's not like we're not trying to. Uh, Keep everything here. Damn. Having trouble with my online clock here, so just give me a second. Okay, we're set. All right, start now. Okay, so thank you, um, Justin, for the invitation to this debate. Um, my name is Ch Reverend Charlie Arp. Uh, I was ordained last summer by the People's Church of Chicago and the Unitarian Church of Quincy, Illinois. Um, I've been in preparation for ministry since about 2016, 2015, actually. Um, so my online ministry, I call it Church of the Revolution. And the um, theme of it is that Jesus is a communist. And if you'll notice over here, I have in my background, it says Jesus made me a communist. It's the title of a book that I'm hoping to publish within the next month. I've been working on it. It's just, you know, finding time and 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 uh feeling ready to do it it's self-published but i will be happy to email the um, <clears throat> college of complexes group and i'll be <clears throat> promoting it all right that's enough preamble why would anybody say something as crazy as that jesus was himself a communist it depends on what you understand the word to mean so i'm going to go back to the origins of the word the, or the word was first used in french in 1790 we're not sure who first uh, may have used it before the academic writer, and um, I forget his name right now. It's, uh, he was talking about two things. He was talking about the way that monks lived and the way that soldiers in barracks lived. And he used the word communisme in French to define the way of life of monks and soldiers, which means a situation in which everything is common property. Um, that word escaped that initial fairly sociological meaning and began to be used by French radicals in the early part of the 1800s. 
And the, most of those early communist radicals were Christians. They identified what they were doing as instituting the economic arrangement of the book of Acts. The first, two, the first four chapters of the book of Acts in the Bible talk about the early believers sharing everything in common. And that, that therefore, the French communist, Christian communist radicals believe that, that Europe was ready to transform itself into a purely communal economy. As we know, those early movements were defeated but a fellow by the name of Karl Marx was involved in some of this. He was a German Hegelian, and he decided to appropriate the communist beliefs. But as he was something of an atheist and was kind of negative about Christianity, I'm not going to go too much into it. He was actually raised a Christian. His father was a Jewish convert to the State Church of Prussia, and Marx was raised as a Christian. So please mute yourselves. Thank you. Um, so Marx decided that he was going to introduce Hegelian radical philosophy and scientific economy to this question of communism. And through that, he met uh, Friedrich Engels and they began publishing particularly the 1848 Communist Manifesto. And for the rest of his life, Karl Marx wrote about communism. There was never a successful communist revolution during the lifetime of Marx or of Engels. But in 1917, as we all know, there was a Russian revolution in, um, in Russia that was led by Vladimir Lenin, uh, Joseph Stalin, Leon Trotsky, a number of other people were leading that revolution. It was the first time a government came to power that called itself communist. That's all the history. But why would I say that Jesus was a communist given the history of 21st cent or 20th century communism? Because going back to that original use of communism as describing how mon monks shared everything in common, and the word common being the, the root word of communism is common, what else would you call someone who believed that private property should be eliminated? And Jesus clearly did that. And so I'm going to begin now by talking about the Bible. We're going to start in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Mary says, Mary has just been told she's going to give birth to the Messiah. And in chapter 1, verse 52, and I'm reading from the contemporary English version of the Bible, verse 50. I'm going to begin with verse 51. It says, the Lord has yes. used. What are you the, doing? Mute yourselves, please. Uh, oh. The Lord has used his powerful arm to scatter those who are proud, drag strong rulers from their thrones, and put humble people in places of power. God gives the hungry good things to eat and sends the rich away with nothing. You can hardly get more radical or revolutionary than Mary, the mother of Jesus. And those are supposedly, according to Gospel Luke, her own words. The next thing I'm going to talk about from the Gospels is the encounter that Jesus had with a rich young ruler. We don't know much about this rich young ruler, except he may have been connected to the synagogue in the town where Jesus was preaching. But he was wealthy. And he said, Jesus, how can I enter into the kingdom of God and eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. Do you follow them? He says, yes, I follow them. He said, then all you need to do is sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And he had riches, and he walked away. And Jesus said later, unless you, speaking to his disciples and everyone in the crowd, unless you all give up everything you own, you cannot be my disciple. This is often papered over by Christians. They want to say, oh, that's only for monks. That's only for priests. That's only for professional clergy. That's not for the average person. But Jesus said it to the average person in Galilee. They should not focus on wealth. They should share all of their wealth. And that comes out clear in the book of Acts, where the early Christians shared all of their wealth. And that was the story in the God for, uh, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 6, it says that the church was destroyed by the leadership of the um, Roman Empire. They basically forced the Christians out of the city of Jerusalem, who were basically occupying public lands, the, the space around the temple and other parts of the city, trying to create the kingdom of heaven on earth, because that's what Jesus said he was there to do. Um, so, And Jesus didn't invent this out of nowhere, because the prophets, particularly Amos, were vituperative against wealth and wealth privilege. And Jesus himself just took up the, the gospel of Amos, the gospel of Jeremiah and Isaiah and said, 
the world should eliminate poverty and wealth, and there should be enough to share for everybody. Now, you say that doesn't sound like communism as it was practiced in the Soviet Union or China or any other supposed nation. And I realize I'm right at, well, I may be close to the 10 minute mark. No, you're at seven minutes. I'll give you an additional five. You don't have to, but I can, I'll, I'll thank you for that note. Um, so I'll be around too. Yeah, can, can we like stick with 10 minutes, yeah. please? Because I time okay, myself. Okay, 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 okay. okay. The 10 minutes. I will, right. three minutes. I, all right. I will, I will wrap up because I was about to. When I talk about the communism of Jesus, the communism of love, I'm not talking about repeating what happened in either the Soviet Union or China or North Korea or Vietnam, although I would also not say they weren't communist. I would say they were attempting to create communist societies in a world in which capitalism was simply too powerful for that to happen. Capitalism is about to die. Ecological climate change will destroy capitalism because you cannot continue, you cannot save the planet without eliminating capitalism. That's an argument that I will make later if the question comes up about why I believe that. We need a new kind of communism. Christianity is the most popular, fastest growing, well, most popular religion on earth. Islam is the second growing, second is the fastest religion on earth. And it does believe that Jesus was a prophet and in a sense, the Jewish Messiah. So what Jesus believed about wealth, if you are a Christian, you should follow it. If you're not a Christian, you should study Karl Marx and understand why he said we should attempt to create communism on earth because it's the only way to prevent the planet from just being destroyed by the behemoth that we call capitalism i am done my friends okay uh you went about eight minutes and 50 seconds we'll go now to our opening remarks by justin so justin go ahead and uh uh you're next all right i'll start my timer All right. I want to thank, uh, first off, if, if it's loud, it's Puerto Rican Day Festival in my neighborhood. I live in Logan Square. There may be some sirens and honking in the background. Sorry. All right. I want to thank the College of Complexes, my esteemed colleagues, Tim Bolger and Charlie Paydock, for hosting this debate. I want to also thank the Reverend Charlie Arp, my comrade in Christ, for participating this evening. And I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thanks to all who came out tonight to listen to this debate. I want to be doing my job if I didn't ask you to please donate to the Libertarian Party of Illinois by visiting lpillinois.org and clicking on the donate button. I'm also asking you to please sign a petition for our statewide slate of candidates and to please also circulate a petition among your friends, family, and neighbors. Visit lpillinois.org slash petitioning. Also, please join the LP Illinois by visiting lpillinois.org slash join. It's free to join, and I don't see why communists would have a problem with that. Libertarians support cutting the red tape to make your worker co-ops easier to get off the ground. Now, the question at hand tonight is, was Jesus a communist? Why do I care if Jesus was a communist? Poverty, war, illness, they still exist in the world after all. But Christ said, for the poor you have always with you, and whenever you will, you may do them good. I care because I enjoy reading the New Testament. I care because I care about the truth and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the truth is Jesus was not a communist as I will posit. I am not here to defend Christian doctrine or the historicity of Christ or the reliability of the New Testament. I'm not even here to argue Jesus was a capitalist or a libertarian. My job Beyond soliciting donations to the LP Illinois is to argue that Jesus was not a communist. Communists point to several places in the Bible. I'll start off with one and cover the rest in the second round of the debate. This is, uh, this first one is from the book of Acts chapter two, describing the Christian community in Jerusalem following Pentecost. And all they that believed were together and all had things in common. Their possessions and goods they sold and divided them to all, according as everyone had need. I'll grant you this sounds similar to Karl Marx's quote from the critique of the Gotha program, but as I'll demonstrate, there's more to communism than sharing property and animus towards the rich. First, I will define what a communist is to answer our question. Google Dictionary defines it as a person who supports 
or believes in the principles of communism. Miriam Webster has a few definitions of communist. An adherent of the ad, an inherent or advocate of communism, lowercase c, a member of a communist party or movement, capital C, an adherent or advocate of a communist government party or movement, capital C, one held to engage in left-wing subversive or revolutionary activities. What then is communism? Google Dictionary defines communism as a political theory derived from Karl Marx advocating class war and leading to a society in which all property is publicly owned and each person works and is paid according to their ability, abilities and needs. Merriam Webster defines communism in several ways. A system in which the goods are owned in common and are available to all as needed. A theory advocating elimination of private property. A doctrine based on revolutionary Marxian socialism and Marxism-Leninism that was the official ideology of the Soviet Union. A totalitarian, a totalitarian system of government in which single authoritarian party controls state-owned means of production. A final stage in society in Marxist theory in which the state has withered away and economic goods are dis, uh, distributed equitably. So far, notice what communism is not. Communism is not giving eat to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, shelter to the stranger, clothing to the naked, or visiting the sick and imprisoned. According to Marx, Marx's partner, Frederick Engels, in The Principles of Communism, communism is a theory of the conditions of the, uh, is the doctrine of the conditions of the liberation of the proletariat, which he describes as that class in society which lives entirely from the sale of its labor and does not draw profit from any kind of capital. He later continues, the proletariat or the class of proletarians is in a word, the working class of the 19th century. Furthermore, the communist manifesto by Marx and Engels says, the immediate aim of the communist is the same as that of other proletarian parties. Formation of, a, of the proletariat into a class, overthrow of the bourgeois supremacy, conquest of political power by the proletariat. A later goes on. The theory of the communist may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. The above, I feel, are representative of the philosophical and colloquial notions of communism. Communism, as you've seen, is not letting others take thy cloak and thy coat. Communism is not showing mercy toward thy neighbor. Communism is not simply loving thy neighbor as thyself. Let me further drive my point. Take the course of action laid out in chapter two of the Communist Manifesto. Number one, abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. That means no land ownership. Number two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. We have this already in the United States and it's received mixed reviews. Number three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. Your kids won't be able to keep your stuff after you die. Number four, confiscation of property of all immigrants and, rebel, and, and rebels. Emigrants with an E, people leaving the country can't keep their stuff. Number five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and exclusive monopoly. Number six, centralization of the means of production and transport in the hands of the state. Number seven, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state. The bringing into cultivation of wastelands and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Number eight, equal liability of all to work. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Number nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of all the distinction between count and country by a mere uh, equable distribution of populace over the country. Number 10, free education for all children in public schools, abolition of factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production, et cetera, et cetera. No such advocacy for the above platform by Jesus exists in the gospels. This plan says nothing about selling whatever thou hast and giving it to the poor. It says nothing of leaving thy house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for the sake of Jesus and the gospel. And Jesus, after Jesus is baptized, 
he encounters the devil while fasting in the wilderness. According to the Gospel of Luke, the devil led him into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to thee, I give all this power and the glory of them. For to me, they are all delivered and to whom I will give, I give them. If thou therefore wilt adore before me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answering said to him, it is written, thou shalt adore the Lord thy God and him only shalt thy serve. Christ was offered political power and he rejected it. He did not seek to institute his mission through the power, uh, through the force of the state or through revolution. Certainly nothing of class warfare. He and his disciples administered to the people I'm gonna go listen to directly this. themselves. No. Furthermore, please mute uh, if you guys are just joining in. Furthermore, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said before Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Now I will grant you Marx or Engels or dictionaries do not have a monopoly on the, on the definition of communism. Communism should be defined as sharing or cooperation, should not, you know, excuse me, could be defined as sharing, cooperation, mutual aid, living in a commune, anti-rich, as some communists do. But this is a reductivist argument hardly anybody other than communists make. The popular conversational definition of communism is more in line with what was earlier described. Furthermore, if it were evident that Jesus was a communist, then this notion that Jesus was a communist be more of an orthodox Christian position. People use words that are available to them. In most minds of English speakers, communism refers to the ideas associated with Marx and the Soviet Union. Communism on more than one occasion has led to oppression, famine, and scarcity not liberation, not nourishment, not abundance. Communism is an, ideology, is an ideology based on covetousness and theft. Communism, when practiced, has led to mass murder and makes an idol of the state. What is described in Acts 2 is Christian praxis. These are lessons Christ taught to the rich young ruler, as I will examine later, and to others who heard him preach the gospel. This is the basis for monasticism, communal Christian living, and how local parishes operate. The Daughters of Charity, the Mini Franciscan Orders, the Catholic Worker Movement, Jesus Freak Communes, Reba House, and the countless other places uh, of this principle and practice to, uh, to follow Christ and to serve the poor requires no revolution, no political action, no uh, coercion, and uh, my time is up. I will continue in the next act. Thank you. Okay, uh, Charlie, if you're ready, uh, you're next. Ten more minutes, another round of 10 minutes. Okay. So <clears throat> I am going to proceed by way of uh, rebuttal. Um, and I invite Justin, if you would like to rebut my original opening statement, that's perfectly in keeping with how we understand debates. Um, so I will agree that the word communism was not used in the time of Jesus, although there was a word that was used quite uh, commonly, which was the Greek word koinonia, which we translate fellowship. And going off of Acts chapter two, where it says the believers had in common, the word there is also a, a version of that Greek word koine common. So koine in common meant similar things. And so when Paul talks about the fellowship of the saints, he is actually could be understood to be talking about the communism of the saints. Now, again, words have elasticity. And I think insisting that Marx was the only communist or was the only definitive communist, or that an average American understands communism as uh, Marxism, that, you know, that's not your, you could be true, but actually what is really interesting to me on that front is the number of folks under, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have a negative opinion of capitalism and a positive opinion about socialism. And I would bet, I would bet that there's been a similar, if not the same level of recuperation of the term communism in the popular consciousness in the United States. Okay, now 
Um, again, I, have, I stipulated at the beginning that I was not going to say we should repeat what happened in Russia or in China or in anywhere. What will happen in the United States in the event of the collapse and breakdown of capitalism? Because that, that breakdown was happening in Russia and that's why the communists were able to come to power. The kind of capitalism that they had, which was merged with the feudal empire of Russia, was simply unsustainable and it fell apart. And when it fell apart, the communists came in and took over it and rapidly industrialized the country at a level that would make modern capitalists uh, salivate if they could industrialize a small country that rapidly in the way that Lenin and Stalin did. Now, we are now at the end, we are now at the early, nearly at the beginning of the, or the, nearly at the end of the last quarter of the 21st century Soviet style communism collapsed in the 80 in 89 and only really survives in any semblance in China, North Korea, Vietnam, and actually North Korea for the most part has rejected Marxism, but we can still they still get called communists. Vietnam and Cuba. Everywhere else, if there are communists, such as in the Ker state of Kerala in India, the communists actually run that government in Kerala. It is possible to be a communist party with a level of power and not a dictatorship. It has happened there. The communists have been a partner in the post-apartheid governments of South Africa. Communists are not always bent on dictatorship and experience and the subsequent, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you've seen communists participate in democratic governments. Now let's talk about communism brought in suffering and poverty and imprisonment and mass executions and all of that is true at different periods of time. But what was capitalism doing at the same time? Capitalism was taking over impoverished countries, basically turning the citizens of those countries into slave or laborers at poverty wages and bleeding the resources dry from country after country after country in Africa, Latin America, and the Far East. And this is why you had rebellions in Indochina and Southeast Asia, because they just couldn't take capitalist imperialism anymore. And those fights are still going on in the Philippines and in Nepal. So again, what communism will be in the 21st century will be not your father's communism because that day is gone. The day when we could say Russia or China was the leading communist country is gone. I mean, China's communism is very pragmatic. I, I hope they can eliminate extreme poverty. They claim they're going to in their nation. They would be the first industrialized nation on earth, actually, period, to eliminate extreme poverty if they succeed in that goal. I don't know if they will, but they're doing it by a combination of capitalism and socialism. Please mute, please mute folks. Yeah, yeah, Matt. Please, please mute <laughs> while we're, the presentation's going on. And Can I'll you give me done. a time check, Tim? Because I this part- I don't Five know. minutes. Five minutes, all right. Go ahead. So again, capitalism every day kills starving children in Africa because if there was a way to bring food, and there is, we have the planes and tanks and we have everything we need to bring food to starving masses in Africa, but it doesn't turn a profit, so nobody will devote the resources to it. And so again, the world has still has a poverty problem, despite the fact that capitalism has lifted millions out of poverty, there are still millions and even more than a billion or two, and I've looked at the poverty figures lately, still in poverty, despite what Bill Gates and others want to make you to believe about the, the poor being lifted out. Yes, that, that has a cap occurred in some places, but there are all, also places where it's endemic. Poverty is still the ruling condition for the majority of the society. In fact, even in the United States, economic inequality has skyrocketed. The CEOs and the top owners of corporations make ungodly amounts of money and the average worker stag has stagnated. $15 an hour is no longer enough to live on because I live on 15 bucks an hour. It's not enough because capitalism and inflation. I mean, I just paid Five seventy-five to an, a gallon to to load my car. Inflation 
is a recurring crisis for the poor. The wealthy just absorb inflation. They just, oh, well, you know, that just means more profit for me down the road. But for the poor, inflation is a virus. It is a disease that destroys their lives, much like coronavirus. So again, whatever you want to say that communism did in the 20th century, capitalism was doing roughly the same things, taking over countries and forcibly industrializing them, forcibly extracting resources from them. And I would say that some communist-led countries like Yugoslavia were actually far better <laughs> than the way the United States treated many of, or the capitalists backed by the United States and Western Europe treated many of the countries that they industrialized in the name of capitalist expansion. So here we go. Uh, how much time left? Tell me, uh, Tim. Three? Did you say three? I, I you can't, you're muted. 735. Huh? Am I out? Oh, 730. Okay, 735. Thank you. Um, so again, we can debate whether my strategy of trying to reclaim the word communism and it with Christianity is a good strategy. I agree, it's not something that everybody wants to do. If I did, I would have a whole cadre of Christian communists that I could parade for you. They do exist. I have Karina on this call would call herself a Christian communist, maybe not agree with me on everything. And many people would. Um, and and particularly outside the United States, because the United States has this weird thing of we're the richest country on earth, but we also have one of the greatest wealth inequalities on earth. And that leads people to feel like maybe I could get rich when the fact is it's not possible for the vast majority of Americans to live an actual comfortable life, to get decent and sustainable health care to keep a job because jobs are disappearing right and left at the same time they're being recreated. When they're recreated, they're at $15 an hour or 14 or 13. You know, in Chicago, they're all at 15, but parts outside Chicago, $15 wage is not normal, not ordinary. So again, capitalism is in crisis and I could talk about that more. The ecological crisis, the climate change is being driven by industrialization, being driven by fossil fuels. We need to eliminate those things. And until I hear a libertarian tell me that they agree that we need to eliminate fossil fuels, I won't take it seriously that they think there's a green, there's a libertarian path to a green global new economy. I think you have to use some kind of global centralized planning to eliminate climate change and to restore the ecosphere. And I guess I will end on that point. Okay, Justin, your uh, 10 minutes for rebutting. Okay, Justin, if you're ready. Unmute, Justin. All right. All right, we'll start the clock now. Go ahead. All right. Perhaps the, uh, I, I will make, I will address a lot of uh, Reverend Arp's points uh, later on. Um, and he made a lot of good points and I, and I wanna, uh, some of them I'm very interested in. Um, perhaps the most popular evidence of Jesus being a communist by communists comes from the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler. The story come, appears in three of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and is told slightly differently each time. It is only in Luke that the man is referred to as a ruler, and only in Matthew is he referred to as young. In the story, the man comes to Jesus and he asks how he can inherit eternal life. Jesus tells him to keep or to know the commandments and list them out. The Gospels disagree on the list and their order, but the commandments are you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your mother and father, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, do not defraud. When the man tells Jesus he observed the commandments, Jesus tells him, sell all whatever thou hast. You miss graven images. Uh, Calvin. Uh, one full at a time, please. Calvin. And actually, that's uh, not in there. Uh, <clears throat> sell all whatever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. The rich young ruler then, having said, then having heard these things, became sorrowful for he was very rich it is interesting to me that the man is both rich and a ruler 
Perhaps his wealth was procured because of his status of, as an overlord with the coercive power of the state behind him. Rulers usually do not provide goods and services for willing customers. The story goes on. And Jesus, seeing him become sorrowful, said, how hardly shall they have that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus later continues, amen, I say to you, there is no man that has left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive much more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. Matthew and Mark end this episode with Jesus saying, many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. This story has also been pointed out as evidence that hell is for the rich, uh, but it's not, it's not as simple as that. While Jesus describes the difficulty of rich entering the kingdom of heaven, it is not impossible because as we are told in the story, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Jesus did not damn the rich young ruler in this passage. He rather challenged the man to go beyond knowing the commandments. The story of the, itch, of the rich young ruler can be uh, contrasted with the story of Zacchaeus from Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He was rich, but he was also a short man. When Jesus comes to Jericho, Zacchaeus climbs up a sycamore tree to catch a glimpse. When Jesus passes, he calls Zacchaeus by name down from the tree and tells him that he is to receive him uh, to receive Jesus in his home. It is here that Zacchaeus confesses, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have wronged any, any man of anything, I restore him fourfold. Jesus said to him, this day is salvation come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Christ's mercy, as we have seen here and in other places, is not just for the poor, but it is for everyone. This includes tax collectors. This includes the rich. It's also for this reason that woe to you are the rich from the Sermon on the Plain is not evidence that Jesus was a communist or that hell is for the rich. Same with St. Mary in the early chapters in Luke. Communists also point to the cleansing of the temple told in all four gospels slightly differently as further evidence that Jesus was a communist. In the gospels of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus cast out all that brought and sold in the temple, overthrows the tables of the money changers and the chairs of them that sold doves, suffers not any man should carry a vessel through the temple and says, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer to all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. In the Gospel of John, Jesus makes a scourge of little cords and drives them all out of the temple, the sheep and also the oxen. And the money of the changers he poured out and the tables he overthrew. And to them that sold doves, he said, take these things hence and make not the house of my father a house of traffic. A house of traffic also means a house of trade, uh, a house of merchandise or a marketplace. If Jesus was not a communist, why did he drive out the money changers? That's simple. Because they turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves. In other words, those in the temple in the temple were not honoring the commandments. You shall not steal. You shall love your neighbor as you as yourself and do not defraud. There is no record of Jesus interrupting marketplaces outside the temple, nor does he explicitly condemned trade in, gen in general. He was a carpenter, after all. In fact, without markets, the rich young ruler would be in no position to sell his property. But without, uh, but what about the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, half the house of traffic and instead of den of thieves? Jesus was tr uh, trying to keep the temple a sacred place of prayer. A house of prayer is not a market. He was trying to separate the holy from the profane. Communists will also point to the Gospel of Matthew's Olivet Discourse for more evidence of Christ's communism. Describing those who are inhospitable and uncharitable, Jesus says, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me not to eat. 
I was thirsty and you gave me not to drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked, you cover me not. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And Jesus continues, amen, I say to you, as long as you did it not to one of these least, neither did you do it to me. For these shall go into everlasting punishment, but the just into everlasting life. And as I've similarly stated earlier, none of these things requires revolution, does not require political action, and requires no coercion. Market economies allow for voluntary mutual aid and acts of charity. In order to be for an act to be virtuous, it must be performed freely. If there is coercion, which communism requires, there is no virtue. While I wish I had more to examine, I wish I had more time to examine all the other alleged proof of Christ's communism, I will end with a phrase Christ used in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or we will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What is mammon? According to Miriam Webster, it's material wealth or possessions having a bit of debasing influence. This violated the greatest commandment, which thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind. It is one thing to make an honest living as jo uh, as St. Joseph and Jesus did as carpenters. It's another thing to be consumed by greed and to acquire mammon through force and fraud. According to priest and theologian, Father Robert Sirico, quote, greed isn't good and it isn't the essence of capitalism. Greed is not necessary to the process of wealth creation in the capitalist economy. Greed exists in every capitalist economy, of course, because you find greed everywhere there are human beings, unquote. <laughs> that means greed existed in Russia before the October 1917 revolution, and greed existed in Russia after the October 1917 revolution. That is because humans are fallen creatures. As Jesus told the rich young ruler, why dost thou call me good? None is good but God alone. And with that, uh, I will uh, use the rest of my time to say thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Reverend Arp. Thank you, audience. Um, please, uh, you know, um, donate to the Libertarian Party of Illinois. Help us circulate petitions to help get our candidates on the ballot. It's beneficial for communists to do this as well. Uh, and uh, in the name of the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank okay, you. I'd like to, if there is no objection, I would like to give a, two more uh, a round of two minutes each for closing statements for both of our uh, people, because I know, uh, uh, you know, so I, you know, I'd like to give Reverend Charlie up a chance to do two minutes for a closing statement and Justin Tucker, two minutes for a closing statement. We'll keep it to two minutes and then we'll go to questions. So Charlie, go, uh, Reverend, go ahead, please. You're, you're muted, Reverend. Okay. I am, um, since Justin has promoted his, um, his, and I apologize, I'm going to screw up my background for a minute here. Uh, I'm trying to get to my link tree page. Here it is. I'm going to share this in the, um, in the, um, here we go. Copy that. I'm going to share this in the chat. You can go to my link tree. Uh, if you would like to donate, go to Patreon. That's where I accept donations. You can also see my YouTube channel and other things. So here we go. I'm putting it in link tree. There's wait a minute, didn't make it. Damn it. It's hard to do this on a phone. OK. Uh, OK, there we go. I'm done. I'm done. Um, I don't know if we want to do it. I, you said two minutes. I don't really need it. Uh, what we had talked about beforehand was that each that Justin and I can each ask the other two questions and they would respond. Okay. And okay, so then, I'm, let's I'm, do that then. I'm prepared for that. OK, then so, let's go ahead. Yeah, I'm not prepared for a two minute statement. Tim, Tim you need to stick to the program. Right, all right, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead, uh, Reverend, ask your two okay. questions to Justin. All right. And Justin will ask your two questions to him and then we'll go to and then we'll go to uh, questions. 
Okay. So um, the first question is going back to your treatment of the temptation narrative where Satan takes Jesus on the mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, I'll give these to you. If you worship me, Jesus says, I won't. Um, he says, you know, I worship only the one true God who created everything. Um, and you say, you describe that as rejecting politics. Um, it's interesting, as the leader of a libertarian party, how do you reconcile Jesus' rejection of politics with your own politics? But even further, when Jesus came down out of that temptation experience, he said, the kingdom of God is arriving on earth. And he asked us to pray that every day that the kingdom of God arrive on earth. He was political, or was he not, when he said the kingdom of God needs to come on earth? Um, and second question. Um, in Matthew 25, you said uh, that this was individual charity and that there's no virtue if you give, your, give, you give to the poor, but you aren't loving when you do it. Here's the thing, to a poor person giving me food when I'm starving is whether you meant to be good or not, I don't give a damn, give me the food. And I would say that Jesus probably had a similar pragmatic attitude, give to the poor. And so when the, when the, the, that, that, Matthew 25 chapters talk about the end of the world, as, as it were, the end of when, when the, the arrival of the kingdom on earth, and it said he will send away those who have the nations, and that's important. He uses a plural noun to describe these people. They are nations. He sends away nations into destruction or nations into eternal life. And we can debate what eternal life and destruction mean. I don't believe in eternal hell. I'm a Unitarian Universalist, but neither I do believe that Hitler probably should burn for about six million years, but then let him out if he promises to be good. Um, that's sort of a joke among us Unitarians. Okay, so my question there is, is there no such thing as responsibility and capitalism is a collective if it is nothing else? How do you understand collective institutional organization in your libertarian philosophy? So my two questions to resum them up. One, was the kingdom of God political? And two, what about collective responsibility? Do you simply reject it entirely? Okay, right, those are good questions. Um, thanks for asking. So uh, I, I, what I said was that Christ rejected political power. I didn't say he rejected politics. You're very correct. I agree with you when you say Jesus was political um, because uh, he does talk about being a king and um, and uh, he add, he, 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 he basically amends the law of Moses. Um, I, I reconcile that uh, because, well, I mean, I, well, I, like I said, I, 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 I don't seek to rule all the nations of the entire world. So I, uh, I mean, I have to make change. So I have to organize politics and, you know, do, you know, try to make change in certain avenues. Um, through dem democratic means, um, but I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I'm rejecting. I, you know, I'm not saying Jesus re rejected politics. I'm saying he rejected rule over all the nations of the of the earth, and I think those are two different things. Um, and then you said, my, how do I? Uh, what is our responsibility? Um, so, collectively, uh, collectively, in, not in, as individuals. Nations, and you're right. It does say nations. Uh, I was referring specifically more to the acts that, that you can do that, you know, that was described there, which is getting food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, etc. Now, um, I think mutual aid is a, is a very good thing. I think that private charity also is a very good thing. I mentioned the Catholic workers earlier. Um, I personally... Uh, that's a cause I personally regularly contribute to. Um, and Adam, that reminds me, we got to drop off the stuff uh, that we all, that our chapter collected uh, uh, for uh, the Catholic worker. Um, as f there are libertarians that do believe in a social safety net. There are libertarians that are not anarchists. Some libertarians do believe in a universal basic income. 
other libertarians believe in a very decentralized bottom up uh, uh, approach. Um, you, you had mentioned massive inequality in the United States. Um, we have a huge population. I think that instead of administering our, our welfare state from DC, we can maybe have the 50 states bottom up, try their own, how their own safety nets work, what works well, and other states can adopt what's best. Um, personally, I, I, I'm in the Knights of Columbus. So I actually, uh, in addition to the, to the, to the, to the Catholic workers, I, I, I pass a can to collect, you know, to, and, and do other sorts of things to help people. Um, and I also, uh, personally, if I were to eliminate certain aspects of government, I think things that help poor, help poor people should be at the very, you know, top of, you know, maybe the last thing that we can eliminate. Um, I don't think we'll ever get to that point, but that is my, my take on that. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, is that your answer, Justin? Now, why don't you go ahead and ask uh, Reverend Charlie Earp his, your two questions to him. So I actually, I've been trying to think of some questions and I really haven't. So. I'm just going to ask some really playful questions. Um, what's your favorite one? Number one, what is your favorite movie? And number two, any movie, I don't care, whatever. What's your favorite movie or a handful of movies? And number two, what is your favorite uh, story in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and, and I appreciate the playfulness. I realize I've come on as a bit confrontational. I'm it's been a long day. <laughs> I've been working for the capitalist man this afternoon. <laughs> oh, so, um, I have to make a living, and and uh, it sucks. Um, so, my favorite movie. It, it's really complicated. So I have a flick chart. If you know what a flick chart is, because I couldn't figure it out. I loved all these different movies, but I'm gonna tell you what's at the top of my flick chart: Selma, The Mission, and The Matrix trilogy. And then below that is like Star Trek, because I am a hardcore Trekkie, especially that episode where John Luke Picard says, we don't pursue wealth in the 24th century. We pursue self-improvement. I think that's great. Even Marx believed in self-improvement. Go read him. He was very clear he believed in self-improvement. And that once you got rid of capitalism, everybody could improve themselves. Um, OK, the other question was favorite Bible old Hebrew scripture story. I call it the Hebrew scripture because even though I am a Christian, I am also a universalist and I don't like the idea that Christianity is superior to Judaism. It's not. Boy, I tell you, sometimes I would I would go for <laughs> something Jewish over something Christian any day. Sir. All right, but um, I'm going to give you two stories because I actually love the creation story. I don't take it literally. I'm an evolutionist, but I love the the first chapter, that creation, you know, let there be light. God created the heavens and the earth. I love that. It's a poem. It's beautiful. It's not literally true, but it's beautiful. And then I like the Exodus story. God taking this poor group of slaves out of That's Egypt that, that and taking them into the into a new land with a new law where they ideally would not be uh, exploited. And the law of Jubilee, which every 50 years, you talked about generational wealth. The law of Jubilee actually prevents generational wealth from passing to hand to hand. But that's a whole other conversation. I realize we're not going to implement Jewish law. But my two yeah. favorite Bible He's stories are mute, the if, you, if you're not the story and the Exodus story. <laughs> Exodus story and I was and yeah that's that's a good one. I I, I was I was kind of thinking you would do do that. Uh, yeah. and, and also to your, uh, I like Star Trek too. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen the mission, but the recently departed Neo Morricone, I know did the score. Uh, so I'll, I, I'll check it out. Do recommendation. Dude. It's excellent. And, as a Catholic, you should love it. <laughs> oh yeah. I I'll, I'll check it out. And also, um, uh, what was that? What did you say that website again? Or your flick, what your flick, flick. what? Flick chart, F L I C K C H A R T dot com. I don't know if you can find my chart. You could try, 
my user ID is Charlie, C-H-A-R-L-E-Y 63. You might be able to find my chart. It's not very, it's not exhaustive. It's just my favorite movies with a bunch of movies that I've seen that are not favorites. Like I got some of my worst movies on there, but like my favorite comedy is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can move on to other questions. Um, yeah. Uh, I just also wanted to, as a Star Trek fan, mention Janice Rand yeah. is named after, who do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Iron Man. But you, you do know that Major Barrett Roddenberry said that Gene Roddenberry was sympathetic to Maoism. So, <laughs> but this, yeah. was the, yeah, this was the 60s yeah. during the New Left era. And everybody was kind of sympathetic to Mao in those days on the left. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, all right. Awesome. Don't, don't, forget know. About the, don't forget about the Ferengi rules of acquisition. <laughs> have you seen Discovery? Have you seen Discovery? I, I have not. I, I, have. I, I actually, I got Paramount Plus for like a free trial to basically watch Picard. <laughs> but I, I just didn't have the time. And, and I think I might get it for a month or so because there's a lot of good stuff on there I still want to catch up on. But okay. let's move right. on to other questions. Yeah. The times All right, good. now, we're going to move now to our general question and answer period. Karina's had her hand up since the beginning of the last thing. So, Karina, if you got a question, uh, unmute and ask it. If not, I'll uh, pass on to the next person. Well, uh, my question is really is directed really to Reverend Charlie. You were fantastic. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, one thing that somebody pointed out to me several weeks ago was that uh, communism, I mean, big C communism, Marxism was designed, it, uh, it started, Marx wrote his work when society was already industrialized and he envisaged a, a revolt of the proletariat, like factory workers, industrial workers, uh, you know, against the owner's production. But uh, Jesus lived in an agricultural society. And so uh, what I feel mostly, I mean, I'm no scholar, but I feel that what Jesus would really have wanted was agrarian communalism as was practiced by the shakers and as you mentioned some of the religious communities and is even practiced uh, a excuse me, madam. Uh, do you have a question this is for yeah, questions yeah uh, how would how would he explain uh, the you know, the any discrepancy uh, that jesus lived in an agrarian society and communism was designed for an industrial society. How would you explain that you know, diversity? I, I have an answer and, and, and I apologize in advance for this answer because it assumes certain things that people may or may not agree with. What happened at the end of the gospels is that Jesus' body is assumed into heaven and he sits down at the right hand of God and is ruling over history through everyone who is faithful to him. To me, that doesn't mean the church, because I think Marx was more faithful to Jesus than most of the church. Um, yes, he was an atheist, but I don't think God held that against him personally. But Marx was raised Christian. He knew the, the Jewish scriptures very well because his grandfather was a rabbi. And he, his favorite theologian or philosopher was Hegel, who was a Christian. And so Marx, in my opinion, really... What his onus against Christianity was against the way his father had been forced to convert to get a good job and the way that the Prussian Catholic Church and Protestant Church treated people, including his own Jewish relatives. That's why he hated Christianity, because it was doing a pretty shitty job there in his country. But in general, he transformed, you know, just like I don't think we have to go back to an agrarian society. I do. I am an ecological. I'm an eco-socialist. I believe we need to eliminate fossil fuels. We need to dial down our extraction of metals from the earth and so on. But that should be done in a planned manner that doesn't harm people in the process, that doesn't create more pockets of poverty, eliminates as many pockets. In fact, in my opinion, it isn't communism until every last pocket of poverty is wiped off of the face of the earth and everyone is living happily. And all of the animal species are living in sustainable ecosystems as well. So 
Um, I don't think an agrarian society can be, I don't think we can turn back the clock and go back to agrarian communism. Yes, Jesus was in an agrarian society, used agrarian metaphors, but that doesn't mean, you know, if he's in having all this, he knows what the, the deal is. Jesus is on the side of science, in my opinion. And Marx was a scientific socialist. And I'll end with that. Thank you, Karina, for the question. Okay, uh, Brian DeHenny, you're next. Ask your question. So, you know, I am also a Unitarian Universalist, uh, more in the Lysander Spooner tradition. Um, and, I, and I find libertarian principles to be much more compatible, certainly than communism. The issue with communism is, you know, first of all, private property ownership and, and the free market has created unprecedented prosperity in the world. Um, I, I think you ignore that. And, and second of all, you know, it, communism relies on the initiation of force and the coercion of people to hand over the fruits of their labor to the state in order for the state to reallocate them in the way they want. Do you have a question? This is not. This is not. I, I want to know how you reconcile um, your Unitarian Universalist principles with the use and initiation of force. Thank you. So there is a debate in Unitarian Universalism now um, over to what degree we have let the um, Western Enlightenment, the bourgeois middle-class privilege of white people dominate and dictate what we decide. If you don't believe in the initiation of force, would you have fought in the Civil War which eliminated slavery? To me, the Civil War was a justifiable war. Were there, ex ex were there terrible extremes gone to on both sides? Yes. But in the end, it's a good thing that slavery was abolished. It's too bad it took a war to do it, but I'm not crying over the war. I am, I am happy that slaves were liberated in the South. Same thing with World War II. I think Hitler needed to die. The fascist state needed to be wiped from the face of the earth. We've never had a fascist government since. I count that as a victory for Stalin and for Roosevelt. They've teamed up on that one because Hitler was a blight. I was a Mennonite, I was a Quaker. I'm still a Quaker, but you know, I believe in in that at times force is justifiable in the service of justice. And Unitarian Universalism has a long history of military and political leaders in it, going all the way back to, you know, even before Unitarian Universalism lived in the, the revolutionary period in the United States. Um, maybe your Unitarianism is totally libertarian and no first use of force. I think there are times when the first use of force is justifiable and the, the Catholic church with its theory of just war is on my side, I think. And again, I'm not a Catholic. I am a Unitarian Universalist and most Unitarian Universalists believe in some version of, of just war. Um, so that's, I'll, I, I don't know what else to say with the question. And I would like somebody next to ask Justin a question. I've had two in a row. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Well, Charlie, you're the next questioner, so go ahead and ask. Okay. Uh, a central feature of free market capitalism is the sweatshop. They've been around since 1760 and still exist today. It's institutionalized poverty. I was wondering, what do you, what do you think Jesus would say about people who advocate a system that bring that in which you find the sweatshop. What would Jesus say about sweatshops and the system of the sweatshop? Yeah, that's the system in which sweatshops operate. Uh, can we define what a sweatshop is, please? Come on, Justin. Be specific, please. Be specific. Is like a is like well, let's, is is a Google is a sweatshop a you so what Google children work Asia. And you'll see some pictures. Okay, so we're talking about child labor. Okay. We're talking Kelvin. about a sweatshop. All right, Kelvin, I'll get to you next. Okay, so uh, I don't think Jesus would mainly, I don't think, I mean, I don't think he would prove of, of I mean, I don't know. Jesus was an agrarian society. I think children were already working already on farms and stuff. So oh, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, in, in, I'm sorry. Jesus approves of child labor. Did I say that? I mean, 
is if a kid wants to like mop the floor for an allowance, is that bad? Do I think should do I personally feel kids should be in in sweatshops? No, um, I think that because of of Christian society uh, has has made people very empathetic and made the plight of the poor. We were able to raise our standards uh, of what you know is acceptable for children to do. To you know uh, because because I think of a lot of christian influenced empathy for the poor kid we we now aren't very approving of it when kids work out in the farms so i don't know is that is that a is that an acceptable answer well i don't care if it's an acceptable answer to charlie he asked it he gets one question let's move on to the next one okay I have, I have uh, no, no, kelvin's next and then we'll get to you okay okay my my question is kind of to justin mostly but um do you not think that uh, Christian, I'm not talking about Jesus as per se, I would view as a spiritual leader, moralist, yeah. but Christianity uh, in itself, in, in the way it's personified itself, as uh, the worst aspects of, uh, of communism. And uh, you said before that you didn't think that. Um, uh, graven images was in, in, in the Ten Commandments. Can I just uh, read? No, no, no. I, I was talking very specifically uh, about Ten the Commandments. Okay. Where he talks Thou about shalt have no other god before me. Right? Thou shalt not make unto which uh, any graven images. Thou shalt where are you reading that from? The Lord God in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Honor thy father and mother. Right? Then it gets onto the Thou shalt not kill and stuff like that. But the first off. They are all authoritarian diktats. And Christianity in its worst points is communism in its worst points. It is that authoritarian diktat. It's like you cannot touch your, your genitals. You can't touch your genitals. Yeah, I can I can tell you, you can't touch your genitals of somebody else. And well, you can't. You can only touch certain parts. Kelvin, please ask a question. Do you not think that that Christianity is the embodiment of the worst of communism? Take, for example, North Korea. All right, can I answer the question you know, or what? Go on. Good question. All right. So uh, <laughs> you had mentioned the first several commandments. I, I assume you were reading that out of Exodus. Well, uh, yeah, just Google it, yeah. Okay, so I was quoting specifically from the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler, where the commandments... Yeah, but I, I, I said, you also mentioned the technology. One full at a time, man. I, I'm either answering the question or, oh. or what. Okay. So, in, in that portion, there says nothing about idolatry or graven images. Or, or anything about loving the Lord your God. Yeah. Although later on in the Gospels, like in Matthew and other places, Jesus does say what the greatest commandment is. But he did say but, all of the uh, Come on, dude, let me answer. Kelvin, let him finish, please. So, um, so as I already at, or as I mentioned uh, when I was answering a question for Charlie, Reverend Earp, uh, uh, Christ, Christ amended the law of Moses, and I take that as Christ kind of getting rid of those authoritarian notions. Although he does say later on, you know, love the Lord with all your, you know, all that. And, um, and, and, and you only get one question. Tell me, tell me, you get one question. Just, tell, you get one me, question. Tell me, tell me, you tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, You don't get a follow up. Mute him. This is a question. Explain is, to me, Justin. I'm not answering how, it. Man. We got to go on. I'm not even done answering the how question. How is Christianity upholding those laws? You've asked like okay. several questions, man. Kelvin, let's move on to our next questioner. Okay. I have a question. All right, Lana, you're next. I told you you would be. No problem. Okay, Kelvin, we'll we'll get back to you later on in the rebuttals. Okay. okay. We're not we're not trying to discount you, but we will give you a chance to speak in the rebuttals. Okay, Lana, you have the next question. Thank you so much. 
her presentation. Uh, Mr. Charles, I have a question for you. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. So really, uh, so many lately news about UFO. What's your opinion? What do you feel like UFO real approach if they exist and, and uh, what, what's your opinion in general about UFO? Thank you. You asked a question about UFOs? Yeah. Like, no, you, uh, what's your opinion? Uh, <laughs> I, I um, the only the only the only thing I can answer is the science, and there is none. UFOs have never been um, documented to anyone's satisfaction. It's vague little images on the screen, and we know that light speed travel is probably impossible, despite my love for Star Trek. Um, so no, UFOs have never aliens have never visited us. Then Sorry. how come? Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, how come then? Only get one question. It's then over. How it's... Come, then how come Congress? Tim. Congress has. Uh, okay. Tim. Tim. Well, Lana, Lana, we got to move on. Okay, I've got the next question. You're saying was Jesus a communist? I want to know what both of you think about what Jesus would say about fossil fuels. Uh, Reverend, Reverend Arp, you can start that one. Why me first? Because <laughs> the first shall be last and the last the shall fossil be fossil fuels a blessing to humanity. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the bait. I may regret this. Um, I believe history moves in stages, and I believe economic development moves in stages. Um, and... At a certain point in history, the use of fossil fuels accelerated some of the industrial and economic development we needed. Even in Russia, even in China, even in Vietnam, Cuba, fossil fuels did speed up development, which led to benefits. However, the downside of fossil fuels is, of course, warming the, the atmosphere, warming the climate, causing glacial collapse which is bad for the planet. We need that cold ice on the poles and in the mountaintops. We need that and it's going away because we are warming the atmosphere with fossil fuels. My point is, is that we are past the stage where fossil fuels could be used for beneficial purposes. And now it's time to move to the next stage and get rid of the damn things. I just would agree with me or not, although I think he does, but that's, I'm not gonna defend that claim. Justin, what, do you, what about you? I had to agree with a lot of what uh, Reverend Arp said. Um, I I actually I take the CTA. I don't own a car. Um, I one of the you know as somebody who believes in local control, um, I I have no problem with you know paying a fare to take the train to go to work. Um. Although I think that we can decentralize and do a lot of advancements with the CTA and make it, you know, more competitive. Um, you know, if we're going to, you know, I don't have a car, so I don't use the roads uh, unless I'm on a bus. But, hey, at least I'll you know, ride the train. It's If you're going to be paying for transport, uh, you know, I really see no difference um, and whatnot. I think actually subsidies, you know, I think, you know, government, I think subsidizing fossil fuels is just kind of made it, you know, to where people just can drive everywhere and made demand for roads bigger and wider. And, you know, or suburban sprawl, I don't think would exist without, um, cheap fuel. you know, yeah, cheap fuel and like, and, 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 and whatnot. And I would prefer, I, I think that I prefer to be as green as possible. Um, I, you know, I think that, yeah, like things move in stages. I think that we're ready to move on to the next phase. And I think that some innovations brought on by capitalism can help us get there. Okay. All right, uh, Brian, you got the next question. Uh, go ahead, Brian. 
So a uh, question to both of you. Do you think that Jesus would advocate for the theory of just war in to eliminate the evils of modern capitalism and the free market system? And what casualty, what, what body count would be acceptable to you? Thank you. I'll answer that one first, if that's okay. No, I don't think he would. Go ahead, Justin. I, I think he would turn the elite. I mean, Jesus said to turn the other cheek. But I don't think he also said to also, you know, get a sword. So I think that there's a little some nuance there uh, that we that that is is that might be a little too big to unpack uh, at this exact moment. But I think Jesus would mostly be. I mean, if there's a is there if there's a threat, of course you you don't want to wait for the first strike if it's very that threat is very imminent you know somebody's coming at me with the bat you know and i can you know do something to him first before he takes a swing at me i think that that is completely morally justified um i'm not going to wait to get hit with the bat before i'm going to retaliate you know what i'm saying um and i don't think jesus would have a problem with that i think that jesus would have a problem with u.s empire as it exists today. Um, and uh, I think that there's a lot of hypocrisy around people that claim to be pro-life, but, but have that, but are more, let's say, less vocal about what goes on overseas with our bombs. And I guess that'll be the answer to my question. Okay. Uh, uh, do you want to take a swipe at that? Uh... Yeah. Um, I so I thought a lot about war. I was I was a pacifist at the age of nine. Dr. King. I heard his sermon. I have a dream, and I decided that I believed in radical nonviolence that I thought Jesus taught. Um, and. And I said, again, I chose to join the Mennonites as a young adult. I joined the Quakers in my, in my middle life. Um, I'm now 59 and I am now Unitarian Universalism because both pacifism and um, our, our country right or wrong are absolutist philosophies. And as a good Marxist dialectical materialist, you want a war that accomplishes its end with the least amount of casualties possible. Can I put a number on that? No. And every war has always exceeded the number of casualties to accomplish whatever the good that it had accomplished. And this is why the Catholic version of the just war theory said that after you participate in a just war, you still have to go to confession. You still have to perform penance because you did evil in the process of trying to attain a good. And you know, I actually think that was a very wise thing for the Catholic Church to implement is this idea that um, there simply is no pure, pure system of, of um, ethics that will get that will change the world. And Marx would, of course, agree with that. I don't know that Marx would have approved of Joseph Stalin's tactics. I kind of think he wouldn't. But I can admit I haven't done enough study in what Joseph Stalin did year after year. But I think a lot of things he did were probably really wrong. So I wouldn't justify them. I would say. He was in. He had his. He was backed into a corner by all of the thirty countries that invaded Russia on the day of the the day after the revolution. So you know the Western Europe, Western Europe did not want Soviet Union to exist, and they went after it. And he fought back. Was he? Did he ex go to extremes? Yes. You know, and um, history. My question only, was: only in, Would Jesus advocate for right. just war? And 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 in as I say, I was a, you're right. I was a pacifist in his context. So here's the interesting. Okay, I apologize. I'm gonna. This is this is. You're right. My mistake. I was keying off of where Justin ended, not so much how you posed the question. Um, in Jesus' time, there was a thing known as the Zealot Movement. And Jesus was associated with this movement. He was called a zealot at different points. These were messianic rebels who would organize a band of fighters and would go out, attack Roman centurions and so on. Um, and they would pay with their lives and they were crucified. Jesus 
decided, and I think because of what happened to John the Baptist, who was accused of being a zealot and was executed, decided that his tactics were not going to be to raise up an army. What he did was he raised up a multitude of people and marched to the city of Jerusalem, cleansed the temple, knowing full well he would be executed for that. Does that mean that for all time and eternity, Jesus banned violence? I don't think so. He was a Jew after all. He supported the Exodus. He supported the conquest of Canaan. Were there excesses in the conquest of Canaan? Probably. But like I said, conquest, you know, war is war is hell. <laughs> and democracy is the worst possible government except all the others. And sometimes the hell of war is worth is 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 the lesser of two evils. Um, at any rate, I think Jesus given his Jewish heritage, could not have been an absolute pacifist, but that in his time, he saw what happened to the zealots and decided, I won't, I won't fight. I won't take up arms against this, this system. I will just do the biggest possible demonstration against it that I can. Okay, that's okay. my answer. Thank Charlie, you. Since, Charlie, since you've already had a question, I'm gonna let Adam go next since he hasn't had one. So go ahead, Adam, ask your question, and uh, then we'll go to Charlie. Okay. Um, and I was getting my water. Um, for both of the gentlemen, uh, thank you for your presentations and debates while I walk through my apartment. Uh, Charlie, since, uh, Reverend Charlie, since you are a dialectical materialist and have talked about having a more sort of non-literal interpretation of the scriptures, um, have you read the, I can't remember the title of it offhand, but an essay that Engels wrote uh, about early Christianity, a couple of them that he wrote about early Christianity and the, uh, the book of Revelation and the apocalypse, interpreting it as somewhat cynically as a prophecy about something that had already happened, that instead of predicting the future end of the world, it's describing events a generation earlier doing the, the uh, Jewish revolt against Rome and the destruction of the second temple and the sort of you know, apocalyptic end uh, of Jewish society uh, or, or, or destruction of Jewish society in that conflict. Um, and maybe just as a more general question uh, beyond that, uh, if you are a dialectical materialist, what is the degree to which uh, any of this is to be taken literally rather than figuratively. Um, I probably didn't ask that as well as I should have, but I'll let you know. Yeah. Um, um, so when I say dialectical materialism, I restrict what you apply it to. Um, dialectical materialism was a theory, uh, was the outcome of what Marx was doing with taking Hege Hegel and English economic science. So Adam Smith, and, and people like Ricardo, Marx knew these guys and used Hegel to come up with an analysis of capitalism that combined science and dialectical logic. Um, dialectical logic basically is that what appears to be opposite is actually interconnected with that thing which it is opposing. In other words, the workers who are opposing the capitalists are also dialectically connected to the capitalists. And this comes out especially in Das Kapital, chapter one. Now, what do I do with the Bible? I, um, as a materialist, so I think that God is a material entity that we call the cosmos. God is the forces of, of nature, the speed of light, the energy of the spheres, the uh, Big Bang, and all the other uncountable numbers of cosmic universes that have exploded into being. It's all one unreachable cosmic pantheos, pantheistic universe. Um, so I, I believe that Jesus was Jewish, but also a, somewhat of an unorthodox Jew. And he didn't spend time debating what he thought were unimportant questions. And for him, the most important question was, how do we bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth? And that's what he preached about. He didn't talk about who God was, except he called him father, saying that God was the one who was closest to his heart, who trained him in the um, ways of the world. Again, I, I, I have experienced 
God talking to me. I was raised in a Pentecostal tradition and we're taught to search for God's voice within our hearts. And even though now I think that was, you know, training and, and reading the Bible stories and taking them literally, I now don't, but I can still in my heart think that's from God and that's not that, you know, and, and, but I always have to be careful because I don't want to confuse my own conscience with God. God is bigger because God is, as I say, the, the entire multiverse is God. Um, I don't take it literally, but I do, I also allow for, in a way, many atheists and agnostics would not, and many dialectical materials, I allow for the language of devotion to the cosmos, to the source of the cosmos, to love that we see between mother and child, which is the basis of human love. And, and just, you know, I'm a sentimentalist. At the same time, I'm a dialectical materialist. I believe that love will save us more than revolution, more than violence. And the only good revolution is one that's done in the name of love, as long as it's really done in the name of love. So dialectical materialism is a tool, but ultimately I am a religious communist follower of Jesus. I don't know if that answered, but that's just what occurred to me. Did you want okay. to stab at yeah. it, uh, Justin? Justin, you want what to was the question that? again? Um, well, the, the first part, I found the title, I think it was called Revelation and Revolution, uh, or maybe the other way around, the Engels essay about revolution. And because Engels is from a Christian background, he'd written about a couple other things, the peasant war in Germany. I think he'd written an entire book about, he also had one about the early Pauline Christians, you know, after Jesus's time, later in the New Testament. Uh, but that's sort of maybe a footnote if you guys don't know the source material, but uh, yeah, it was about I don't know. the degree to which to take it literally. Uh, I, maybe I'll frame it differently. You know, if these are stories that are written sometimes 40 uh, or the, the, the scriptures, I mean, are written as far as we know, at least 40 years after Jesus's death, and in some cases, maybe close to 100 for the New Testament, what's the... Re how, how literal do you take it? How reliable do you find it, the source material? I, I don't find it to be particularly reliable in a historical context or in, in, a, in, a, in how we understand history today as a field of study. But here's how I understand, here's how I understand uh, scripture. The, the story of uh, Josiah in in uh in the bible so josiah he is a very pious man and he restores the temple and um when he he finds the uh a copy of the law of moses and he wants to make sure that it's good so he goes to the prophetess holda and holda essentially I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. She affirms that it, yes, it is indeed scripture. So my view of scripture is that there's always a magisterium comprised of fallen men who have canonized things as scripture. And I think that's the first instance in the Bible that I can think of other than when maybe God gave Moses the Ten Commandments of there being, um, you know, like, hey, this is, you know, canon or whatever. So um, I, 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 as far as like deductive arguments for the, I mean, I was raised in a Christian home. My father was an elder. Um, I converted to Catholicism as a, as a young adult. Um, and then I was agnostic for several years and have now started practicing again. And I do find like the, the St. Thomas Aquinas proofs and other deductive arguments to be my favorite sort of, uh, you know, even when I was an agnostic, I still was very much like an unmoved mover sort of thing, if I were to take a leap of faith. 
Um, but I do, like I said, I like the New Testament and I, and I, I like the gospels and I was raised in it. And uh, I, it makes me happy to participate in the mass <laughs> and to read the New Testament. So, Thank you, gentlemen. Um, before somebody who's asked uh, um, before, is it possible to ask a question by someone who's not asked a question before? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I recognize that this is not a hermeneutics uh, workshop, but I would appreciate it if uh, some context was uh, interjected into the conversation. We're, we're in a white settler colony that's uh, become a global empire that is now in, in decline. And I think it's useful to, to define some of the terminology that is being used. Uh, I would appreciate it if some definitions with evidence uh, and personal experience is not the singular of evidence. Uh, if, if some definitions were given with evidence for terms like violence, the state, communism, social justice, development, democracy, or even the kingdom of God. Uh, with some evidence either from the social sciences or from the New Testament, admitting that it was written not 40 uh, or 100 in the 70s uh, after uh, the birth of Christ. And with regards to whether Jesus was a communist or not, both Justin and Charlie would benefit from reading some of the liberation theology in Latin America that they've danced. Excuse me, sir, on. what's your question? My question is provide some definitions with evidence for the terminology that I mentioned, violence, the state, communism, social justice, development. How about we just do a few of them instead of, can you be more specific on the definitions? Because Define. That's a lot of words. Is there one word that you most want us to define and we'll agree, we'll do that? Can you pick one? I've been taking notes during your presentation and neither of you have defined any of those with evidence. You've been talking about your beliefs or your feelings and none of that stands up. Okay, any. what's your question? What word do you want us to define? Take your pick. Violence, the state, communism, social justice, development, democracy, or the kingdom of God. I would appreciate it. Justin, can we agree on which one of those two we'll go after? Yeah, go for it. Pick, pick, what do you think? I, I, I mean, the, the, the talk is about communism. All right, um, go with communism. Okay, sorry, right. go ahead. Are you done? All right. No, no, that's, do you want to, I mean, you. well, you did a better job of defining it than I did. Um, yeah. So, so um, you went quite extensively. As, as someone who, um, okay, so. I don't think that there is a fixed definition for wor a word like communism. The root of it is common the, or commune, which is a, a Latin root that, as I mentioned, has a Greek word, Greek root koine, thing in common, shared. That's what communism means. It, it means a system in which everything is shared. And it can be small c, a monastery. It can be a commune. It can be big c, a state in which. Now, the interesting thing is the, the, the states that were called themselves communists, or at least I should say the parties in power that called themselves communists and their societies communists, all admitted that they did not succeed in establishing communism. At best, you have Stalin's claim that he was going to create socialism in one nation. And to the degree he succeeded in socialism is even debatable because it's something that has never been done. And I would argue that capitalism was simply too powerful. It was on a growth curve. There was no way. Like I talked about stages. Communism, as I understand it, is a protest against capitalism. And how, once capitalism collapses, what it replaces it is what Marxists and Christian radicals of the early 1800s called communism is what would replace capitalism. And other people called it socialism. And then the communists said, well, we'll take your word socialism, but make it a transition between capitalism and communism. So what it means 
is always up for debate. At this stage, I think we have to take into account all that history and just say, which word do you want to fight about? I want to fight about the definition of communism. And so I do what I do because I enjoy fighting about what communism means. Because for me, I take a note from Che Guevara. Every revolutionary has a heart of love for the people. And that's what communism is for me, the heart of love, the desire to see no poverty, no more war, no more dictatorships and tyranny. I want to end all that stuff. And I call that communism when we do end all that. But when I'm dead, they'll call it whatever they want to call it when they actually get to that state. And I call that the kingdom of heaven. Anyway, I'll drop, I'll stop now. Go ahead, Justin. I like those. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I like your definition of kingdom and heaven, uh, at least like, uh, I mean, I, I like it as in like, I like that that's your definition of it. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll define the state as you do that. the monopoly, the use, the monopoly of force in a geographic area uh, that has the exclusive monopoly uh, on violence and force um, for defensive purposes. Um, violence being um, things that cause physical harm or uh, damage to your property or, or any other sort of threats um, to your safety. All right, is that it? Okay, Emma, would you like to unmute and go ask a question? Oh, sure thing. Um, so in his book, um, Caesar's Messiah, um, have, have any of you read the book Caesar's Messiah by Joseph Atwell? No. Okay. It's, um, I have it's, read I have read critical reviews of the book. I I know the argument, but I I can't say yeah. I've read his book. I've read critical reviews of it. Well, so I mean, he, in some ways, he's kind of touching the same line of inquiry as Engels in Engels' essay on you know, the historicity of the Jesus narrative. So I guess if I could ask my most basic question, it would be, do either of you really believe that Jesus existed? And if I had a follow-up to that, it would be, if he didn't exist and he was just a story, how does that affect your argument? Real quick, I'm sorry, but my computer crashed, so I wasn't sure who was uh, uh, next on the questions. My apologies, please, for interrupting. I can, I can go with that first. Um, so you, I, I think Jesus existed. Um, I, I, his, um, you know, history, history still wasn't what it is today, but I think Jesus existed. I think the textual sort of, you know, with the number of manuscripts and stuff like that um, is incredible. And I think that speaks some, to something. Um, if Jesus did not exist, I think certainly Paul existed. But I think Paul, ex I think Jesus for sure existed. Um, now, this affects my argument. Well, my argument is strictly just to argue Jesus was not a communist. I can do this with any sort of thing and make an argument. I could say, you know, uh, you know, maybe me and Charlie can do a, a, a talk on was was uh, are the Ferengi cat uh, the Ferengi capitalist, and I would argue it. In the, you know, I could do this all day with anything, you know. I can argue is yes they are but they're meant to caricature capitalism right right but you know I'm just I'm, I'm but I can do this with anything I mean I could argue that you know is Gandalf a communist or not I can argue <laughs> if uh you know Luke Skywalker is a communist I can argue I, if, I was called short on my Christianity authoritarianism stuff but okay you're definitely welcome to jump back in and ask questions for sure. Well, do, you not, do you not think that Christianity is 
We the, don't. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, we still have a live question. Reverend Arp going hasn't on right answered now. the question yet. Okay, go. Cool. Um, and uh, I think I basically answered it. So go ahead, sir. Okay, Kelvin. We Thank got you. it. We got. We got Dan, and then we got Charles. No, no. I'm. I'm going. It's my uh, Tim. I'm answering oh, the I'm, question. I'm sorry, about, Reverend. I'm. I'm sorry, Charles. Sorry. No, no worries. I know you. You got knocked out of the computer and all that. Um, the historicity of Jesus. My argument for Jesus being a communist rests on the faith of people around the world who say Jesus exists for them. And I say, good, read what he said about wealth. Read what he says about the kingdom of heaven and that there will be no poverty when that kingdom of heaven is realized on earth and you're supposed to pray for it every day. I appeal to the faith that already exists in Jesus. So I do not need a historical Jesus. That said, I take the argument of secular, agnostic, and atheist scholars who say the argument against the historicity of Jesus is essentially a conspiracy theory, particularly Atwill's theory, which says Josephus invented Jesus, or at least the Josephus family, which Josephus was a, a well-known Jew who became the historian of the Jewish people during the time of Jesus' life. And he mentions Jesus in like three different places. At will says Josephus invented Jesus out of whole cloth. I think that doesn't explain where Paul got Jesus from. Paul believed in Jesus. And we know that at least seven of the letters of Paul were written by him. And the ones that weren't written by him, some parts of them might have been. So there was a historical Paul. I would also argue there was a historical John the Baptist because more than Jesus, Josephus talks about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the precursor of Jesus. So it's the historicity argument, as much as any first century Palestinian Jew's life can be verified documentarily, Jesus is ahead of any other first century Palestinian Jew. That said, the evidence is kind of slim. I still think on balance, we have good reason to believe Jesus did exist. I'm done. Okay. Uh... Dan all right. Bader. All right, Dan, please go ahead. Yeah. You got your question in right earlier from what I saw. A question? No, Emma Lou, go oh. had her hand up before I left. Okay. And I think she was already taken care of. All right, Dan, please go ahead. Yeah. So I guess my question is maybe more for the Reverend, but. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people these days believe that uh, we are in uh, uh, a rapid kind of global heating, which was discussed a little bit, and that uh, overpopulation in the world is a big contributor to this. And, and so uh, from a communist point of view, uh, what would uh, Jesus do about the overpopulation global heating problem? I know what I would do. And I think this comes from my Christian faith. Although again, I'm not an Orthodox Christian. I call myself a Marxist Christian. Those two, those are the two most important influences on the way I think about life and politics um, and so on. Um, we need to have universal contraception, universal sexual education. We need to eliminate extreme poverty because extreme poverty drives this high birth rates in poor countries, right? Because if you think half of your kids are going to die before they grow up, you're going to have twice as many kids. And so, and they don't have access to birth control and everybody likes a good roll in the hay. So you get lots of babies. My point is, is that I would, I would solve, if it were the overpopulation problem by cutting down, by making contraception universal, birth control universal, which is why I'm not a Catholic among many other reasons. The Catholics, church's position on birth control is just a relic of the middle ages and needs to go away. Um, and I'm sorry, I love Dorothy Day and she supported mm -hmm. the Pope on this point. And I think she was a little not paying attention to the poor. The poor want birth control, they just can't afford it. That said, that's what I would do for overpopulation is um, I would um, 
have global universal, um, and they're already doing this. There are actually nonprofit orgs that go into populations where there is a lot of rapid high birth rates and teach the women about contraception. The women are like, cool, I don't have to have 10 babies, great. So they want it, they just don't have access. And, you know, and it doesn't turn a profit to bring it to them. So I would say right now we have to rely on nonprofits, but eventually I would like the whole world to unite in making contraception universally available. Because I think women yeah. would choose, women would choose to have fewer babies if they could. Okay, uh, any, uh, who, uh, uh, any, did you have, Kelvin, we'll get to you after Charlie, okay? All right, uh, uh, Dan, did you, I, I'm sorry. Did our op loyal opposition have an answer to that question as well? Um, I I think that uh, the uh, I I think definitely pe people are gonna are going to be engaging in in sexual activity, whether the church looks down on it or or not. Um, that said, you know. I think that I I would disagree with ortho like what the church its current position on contraception. I you know I I have no I have no problem with organizations giving away free condoms or or anything like that. I think and then I think there's a lot of uh, I mean, is aren't there aren't there you know, big box stores and, you know, entrepreneurs that are making contraception really cheap, at least in the United States. I don't know. But I think that, you know, if you're going to do it, please use protection. Please try to, uh, you know, prevent pregnancy as best as you can. Um, and I guess that's all I'll have to say about that. Okay, uh, Char Charles, you're next. Yeah, Justin, you were arguing that Jesus wasn't a communist, but an inerrant concept of communism is revolution. Now, Jesus, from what I understand, was preached a few years in rural areas in the countryside, but then on Palm Sunday, he decided to take his ministry into the city, uh, Jerusalem, I guess, and he wasn't there too long before he got in a little trouble with the authorities and was arrested and punished for having radical ideas. Uh, and uh, it, he was considered dangerous, I guess, much like the communists I regarded today, dangerous communists, McCarthy was saying. So I don't understand it. This is probably the biggest revolutionary you could think of, and a commie. So the question is, Jesus was one more time. Charlie, what was the question? And the communists. I'm sorry. What? That's why he got in trouble with the Romans. No other okay, reason. So Jesus was a revolutionary, no, no, and that's no your question. All revolutionaries are communists. Okay, let's no, let's, okay, let's uh, Calvin, you'll be next. Charlie, let's finish answers Charlie's question first. Okay, so the question, okay, so Charlie, I think is at, didn't really ask a question, but I will comment regardless. Um, okay, by revolution, I'm, I'm being, I'm, you know, words can have several definitions as, as we've discussed throughout the evening. Um, so when I talk about revolution, I'm talking specifically violent revolution when I'm talking about Marxism. Now, certainly peaceful revolutions can happen. And, and I would, you know, if, if, if those, if peaceful revolutions that are for actual true justice and reform can happen, you know, let's, let's let it happen. Um, as long as it doesn't empower the state or, or violate the rights of the people. Um, but um, 
But if Jesus being a revolutionary, being a guy who was out there uh, and ministering to the people and who had a large following and who, who had who the, the priests and the Romans were worried could could spark a actual riot and, re and real revolution. Um, yeah, in, in, in one sense of the word revolutionary, you are absolutely correct, Charles. Jesus was a revolutionary. But when I say that Jesus did not support, I don't, when I, I, I don't, but Jesus does not support, I think, 100% sure, uh, class warfare um, or violent, you know, seizing other people's property because that would violate the commandments. Follow up. Nope, no follow up, Charlie. Why not? <laughs> Because we're running out of people who want to ask Jesus, questions. We have right. a Jesus advocate. Can I have a rejoinder to giving, just giving to the poor. Go ahead, Reverend. Go ahead, Reverend. Um, I, I just want to address one of the points that you made about Jesus wouldn't support class warfare. Um, so to me, Luke 6. And I'm going to, this is the Bible. I'm going to use the Bible here. And actually, I'm going to use my own translation because I worked on the Greek in this passage in Luke 6. So I'm just going to read it and let it speak for itself. Why I think here Jesus does identify a kind of class supremacy. Um, so hang on. Luke 6, 17 to 26. And actually, I'm going to skip. I'm not going to start at verse 17. I'm going to start at probably verse 21. I apologize. I, I've got my own translation I'm pulling up here. So Jesus raised his eyes and said to them all, wholeness is arriving for the impoverished, for the divine regime will be theirs. And that wholeness is my translation of the word blessed. Wholeness is arriving for the malnourished, the hungry, for the divine feast will be theirs. Wholeness is arriving for the suffering, for divine joyfulness will be theirs. And then, it, and then I'm going to skip down to where it says, woe, in the traditional translation. I'm going to say, judgment is arriving for the wealthy, for you already possess more than enough. Judgment is arriving for the greedy feasters, for you shall be made hungry. Justice is arriving for the carelessly mirthful, for you will mourn and weep. And justice, judgment is arriving for the highest classes, because through the ages they have listened to the messengers of injustices, the prophets. And then I'm going to go back to the Mary's Magnificat, where she says, God will throw down the mighty and lift up the humble, and the rich, the poor will be given uh, everything, and the rich will be sent away empty. God is a class warrior in Mary's song, and Jesus just elaborates on that. And I realize I'm not giving you an opportunity to rejoin, but you can maybe put it in your closing comments. But I think Jesus was a class warrior for the poor and the oppressed. And I'll stop there. And I have read, Jesus, somebody just mentioned uh, communism in the Bible. It's literally one of my favorite books by Jose Miranda. Someone else talked about liberation theology. Liberation theology is kind of where I got all this other than the Bible itself? Um, I will say that uh, I think it's a little more nuanced um, than just beyond those two things. Uh, and I think as I, as I had pointed out in my, present, in my, my speech, the Zacchaeus um, example is that uh, it's a little more nuanced than that. So uh, yeah, let's move on to the next question. I think you were next. Uh, okay. What uh, you do with the rich man before the revolution is different than what you do with them after the revolution. I'm done. Okay. Okay. Um, I think you both miss the political nature of Jesus. Um, anybody that, that has ever uh, celebrated a, a Pesach, uh, uh celebration with, with Jewish people will know the... Uh, Portent the the, the 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 enormity of Christ entering into Jerusalem, the way he did it under Roman occupation. This is the equivalent of Gandhi walking, you know, riding into Paris on Bastille Day times ten, right? Okay, so the, if you negate uh, Jesus's political influence, then you're missing the whole point, right? Jesus was a moralist in my book. What's your question? 
Okay, do you not think that uh, Christianity, not Jesus, has mimicked the worst <laughs> aspects of communism in its oppression, its suppression of thought? Uh, do you not think that it is, it's, it's worse being a Christian than it is being a, a citizen of North Korea? Because in North Korea, your, your actions are monitored and everything you do is controlled, but your thoughts are not. And in North Korea, when you die, you're free of it. In Christianity, you are not. You are either tortured. So, do you have eternity, a question mark coming up? Or you're, or you're, or you're also tortured by living in the heaven with people that only want to, to, to praise the the glorious leader. So, okay. what is your question again? Do you not think there is, Do you not think that Christianity has mirrored the the worst aspects of communism? I think there are periods in time where certainly Christianity. When it uh, has been um, uh, do you not devilish think it does now? and evil, certainly do you not think it does now uh, as well? Jesus called the uh, the priests vipers. John the Baptist do you not think called them vipers. Still, still mirrors. The you only get one question, pal, and you're gonna have to let me okay, answer. Okay. All right. So uh, yes, the church has uh, has been very uh, evil in its history. Can sit some there's there's a lot of evil aspects of it today, certainly, as as I mentioned in my presentation, there is not no one is good but God. Men are fallen, so of course institutions, even if they're founded by Christ, are going to be imperfect. And do you not think that Christianity in itself is imperfect? Okay. Christianity is totally imperfect, but the thing about Christianity is, is people. The, that's the whole point of Christianity is that people are imperfect. Things are imperfect, and Christ makes you perfect. That's no, the no, no. Yeah, Christianity. Kelvin, let him finish a, answering the question. That's an impossible ideal. Kelvin, uh, that's fine. Whatever. I mean, it might be irrational for me to like practice Catholicism. But, you know, it makes me happy, and I like talking about Jesus and, okay. and being with other people that like All right, all right, I get it. And, and, I, and, I, like, and I like uh, the fact uh, that I'm I can... I'm not going to open this up for debate. Okay, a little Kel, 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 no, 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 guys, please. May, may, uh, may I recommend for you um, Grand Kel, Beans? Uh, actually, we're going to move on ocean. unless Reverend Arp wants to take uh, a stab at that question. Reverend, you don't need to raise your hand. You're, you're, you're. I know. Up. I'm just, just signaling because of the chaos that Kelvin is trying to create. Okay. Kelvin, we, Kel, I just want to speak to Kelvin directly. Okay. Don't interrupt me. Don't interrupt me. Okay. Go. The way this debate is formatted and the way all College of Complex events are formatted, you get to ask one question and we get to respond. And then the next person, it's just fair to everybody else in the room who wants to ask a question to let the next person talk. I realize you have a particular ax to grind and I'm gonna address your ax as I understand it. I call myself a Marxist Christian. I have called my, and, and you of course equate communism with evil. I don't agree with that, but- No, I don't. Uh, well, well, okay, no, no, I'm sorry, please, please. You, when you say, hasn't Christianity done all the worst things of communism? I don't know what that means other than to equate the two. And I don't want to, I don't want your answer. I want to address the audience. No, I'm talking about just here. saying they both got the scum. Elvin, right. let him finish, please. I hear that you equate them. You say they're both scum. That's what I'm trying to say is you equate them. My, what I would say is I, my understanding of Christianity is what is known as radical Protestantism, um, which is a, tradition that dates back to, I would say, the Ebionites, which were a group of Jewish Christians who rejected the Pauline church. And there were also other groups like the Nazarene Christians. These were Jewish Christians who rejected the Pauline church. I go back to that far. I think that not that Paul was always wrong, but the way Paul was used resulted in detouring Christianity. But that's not an argument I want to make today. I want to say that Christianity has decided 
through its history in the Eastern Byzantine Empire and the Western Catholic Holy Roman Empire has has basically imperialism and domination. So I would agree with your fundamental point. That said, Jesus of Nazareth was called the Christ. Do I think he should have been called the Christ? Maybe not. But at this point, it's a moot question. Everybody calls him Christ. So I'll say, okay, I'm a Christian over my own internal objections to it. But yes, the, ma the, the majority church is just like the majority of humanity because they get tied up with systems of power, they become authoritarian and oppressors. I totally agree with your point. I don't think that means that, that there's nothing left good in Christianity, but you have to be really careful what you choose to keep and what you choose to get rid of. And that's why I identify as a radical Protestant, not as a Catholic, not as an Orthodox, and not as a conventional Protestant. I'm a radical Protestant and I am done. Thank you, Reverend. Adam Bowling, you got the next question. Please ask, please unmute and ask away. Yes, uh, I posted this in the chat earlier and to some extent, I think alluded to it, but some of you have talked around this a little bit and hinted at by others. Would you, either of you gentlemen, make any kind of uh, distinction between what religious historians will often refer to as the Jesus movement you know, specifically around Jesus's life, which is more radical, which is more territorially confined, uh, you know, with its more immediate demands, perhaps, against the establishment in Israel and Judea, uh, versus a generation or two later, with the diffusion of Christianity uh, after the time of St. Paul, to other places where, you no, know, there's not an immediate hope of any kind of uh, Judean revolt you know, if it's reaching people in the diaspora or reaching non-Jewish converts, uh, and that, that there's a somewhat more conservative character to that. I know a lot of theologians and historians have made some distinction between the Jesus movement and the more Pauline Christianity, if I understand it. Would you, you gentlemen comment? Uh, Reverend, if you want to, if you want to start on that, you probably have a more, well, you got a more. I want to hear what a, a Catholic says about it. Okay, fair enough. Well, I, Charlie, uh, or sorry, uh, I, I'm trying to be as respectful. I, I, I've been trying to, call, I've been trying to do the Reverend Arp all night long, and sorry if I slip up. But uh, <laughs> uh, Reverend, uh, the, um, um, you call yourself my first name an unorthodox is Christian or an unorthodox Protestant, or, or I too have a lot of unorthodox uh positions that a catholic might hold um so my my i think paul uh there's things in paul that jesus does not address and i think paul was probably trying to re it's to kind of adjudicate things as best as they could based on what they knew of what of of jesus for example, Jesus never says anything about homosexuality or, or, uh, or, um, or, or women not being able to participate in the church. Now, um, I certainly, it's scripture, the church has made it scripture, but I, I do, I love when I'm at mass and I see uh, a member who's a, a woman who's a member of a Vincentian order reading Paul. And if it's in from first Corinthians, it's even the, it's even better. Um, uh, so I think that, um, I, I think that Paul says things that Jesus does not top that, that, did not touch on it unfortunately is now scripture that may and, and i also think that paul was pr probably to my i'm i'm i've not gone to seminary as reverend arp has but i i suspect that uh um paul i i guess i i don't know i hope i think i've answered the question i i, I think i've just 
at this point like out of things to say or okay reverend you want to take a stab at it please i will take it last i do want to ask you tim are we basically moving out of question and answer and well, into we can, we, can, we can do that real quick i don't see anybody else now because i think okay we we'll are going to rebuttals after this okay all right so what i want to do with paul um i i don't think paul gets the blame any more than i think stalin gets all the blame for the evils of communism or mao these are one man and yes they accumulated a lot of power but they didn't do it alone and paul what what you know the prohibition against homosexuality that paul seems to have given support to was a prohibition that existed independent of paul he just imported it into a document a letter that came to be known as scripture and i agree with justin that was a human decision to make it scripture that doesn't mean it is scripture it doesn't mean it's perfect um so i think that the that the that the christianity becoming an institution instead of a movement um and becoming assimilated into the byzantine empire first and then into the Roman Empire as well. And all of that are, is historically contingent stuff. I don't want to blame Paul for all of it. Because oddly enough, I was thinking about this today as I was thinking about during the, the era of Latin mass. Everybody in the Western world was hearing the scripture in Latin. How did they even know what it meant? I realize a lot of people did know Latin, but a lot didn't. It was, it, it didn't make, so they based their faith on going to church on Sunday and talking to the priest in the confessional. And that was sort of the whole of their faith. It wasn't about the Bible. And so my point is, is that I want to give a lot of um, latitude that people, Mark said it very well. Men make history, but not under conditions of their own choosing. And I think the same thing goes to religion. Religion made history, but not under conditions of its own choosing. It's, it's, it's so complex why Christianity became the Holy Roman Church and why it became the Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church. And it's all contingent history. And as a radical Protestant, I'm not beholden to any of it. I follow Jesus, the human who I understand to have been a prophet and in some sense, a manifestation of God, as I believe everybody is a manifestation of God to the degree that we do good in the world. We are manifesting God. Um, okay. I think I've answered the question. Paul. Yeah. I don't like a lot of things he said, but I do love some things he said. I think chapter 13 of first Corinthians is one of the most beautiful passages ever put in print. If I had love, you know, if I could speak with the tongues of men and an angels and I have not love, it's I sound like a clanging symbol. Isn't that beautiful? He was a great writer. And I'm done. Okay. Let's go to rebuttals. All right. I'd like to know who has rebuttals. I know I've got one. And I got a good one. Uh, who else has I want to encourage my libertarian friends and my other friends in activism to please consider doing a rebuttal. I think it would be great to hear what you guys had to say about it. Um, and uh, if you have experience right. in, in, a in, a, in a Christian community that's very communal and you want to share it, please do so. <laughs> okay. I, I know I'm taking hand raisings too, but uh, just also call yourself out. I mean, unmute if you want. Um, so far, I've got myself, Charlie, and Brian DeHennedy. Adam is also Adam Balling. Who else? Kelvin, I know Dan you. Bader. Got I've, got, I've got a quick one. Dan, Dan Bader, and then we'll get to you. All right, Kelvin, we'll get to you too. Okay, so uh, who? All right, who else? Okay, I got myself, Charlie, Brian, Adam, Dan, and Kelvin. Um, I wonder if. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if our ever, if our ever pre present, uh, Karina, I know you've been active in the chat. Do you want to do a rebuttal? Um, me, um, well, uh, it's just, uh, uh, okay. Well, if, if you're not ready, that's, I have it. I have it. I have it. Uh, uh, well, uh, okay. my oh. well, my oh. idea is that uh, Karina, uh, well, what we'll do is we're, we're, we're taking this, this part of the college is where we take a certain set amount of time and you get like three to four minutes to express your views. Um, the reason I'm asking for a rebuttal is if you want to speak at this point and, you know, you'll be able to speak your mind. 
uh, be able to, to do things because this is this is what the real part of the college is. Uh, we had our speakers debate. We had our question period. Now it's your time to debate the topic on or off subject. Uh, so far, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people in here. Who else would like to speak in this part? I know, Karina, you made a sense of it. Um, Steve Grossman. Yeah. Uh Okay, well, Karina, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get to you with, 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 with a certain amount of time, okay? Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, I'll call on you as you go on because each of us is going to have a certain amount of time. And, sure. um, and I mean, I, I, mean, I was just encouraging you because you were active in the chat. I know Adam was in there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, like I said, we still got several people in here who have rebuttals. Now, Reverend Charlie Earp and... Uh, and uh, <sighs> Sorry, I'm Justin. Justin will get the last word. Dan Hustino. What is it? Okay. Now, who else is? Who else is? Uh, okay. So far, it's me, Charlie, Brian, Adam, Dan, Kelvin, and Karina. Anybody else? Anybody? All right. Let's take our speaker and get started. Okay. Charlie, I'm going to put you last. I'm going to go first. I'm going to make it. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. I'll go with about a four minute time frame on each person. And I'm gonna go first. All right. Um, and I'll allot myself four minutes. I don't think I'll take the full time up, but uh, let me get my uh, stop online stopwatch set up here. And so we can get everything else. It won't take but a minute or two to get this uh, thing going here. My apologies, please. It's just taking a second here to set up. I have to get my other computer going here, so probably. All right. Whether we believe Jesus is a communist or not neglects the central reason why Jesus came to planet Earth. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He came to Earth to save men from their sins. And he came down to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could believe in him and have eternal life. That's what his whole life was reflected upon. And that's what the whole basis of Christianity was based upon. A lot of times we take a look at a certain part of Jesus's life, tend to magnify that and put it above what his central message is. Well, my friends, that central message is exactly what Billy Graham used to say in his revival crusades. God loves you. He cares about you. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to be in fellowship with him. And he is your friend. Just like Jesus, who is the son of God, also wants to be your friend. He does not want you to go to hell, but he also gives you the freedom to deny or accept him, which is what I believe what will happen at the end of life. So, you know, our lives reflect a lot. And the reason why there's evil in this world is I believe everybody has what we call a sin problem. That means we're in rebellion against God and we tend to make our own decisions as to what good is and what evil is. God set a certain law that every person has broken at one time or another so that all are without excuse. I will say this, that I became a Christian myself when I was in college as a sophomore. I accepted Christ's death and resurrection on the cross for my sins. But it has been a long journey for me. I claim no divine pretensions. I claim no divine gu not guidance or knowledge. But I do believe in prayer, that God is a friend, and that if you talk to him, he'll talk to you. And that if you, if you want to seek him out, he will make himself known to you. I firmly believe in the inerrancy of the scriptures, and I believe that there is a scientific and rational basis for my belief in Christ and his eternal power and the inerrancy of scripture. We can get into that at some other time because I've looked at these things very deeply and actively have been actively engaged in it. What I'm going to say is this, coming to Jesus and learning his central message was not about communism nor capitalism, but about the redemption of your soul to save you from your sin and to protect you to go into heaven. 
It is very simple. God, I'm a sinner. I accept that you have a right to divine judgment, but I also accept the sacrifice that your son made for me. And that with that, both in Protestant and Catholic faiths, believe that Jesus Christ was a son of God and that his central message was to save men from their sins. With that message, I will now move on to the next rebuttal. Thank you very much for letting me make that very clear. Next. Okay, uh, Brian, you got a rebuttal next, so go ahead, please. And Ethan will add you to the list. So uh, something about Jesus is he had unlimited bread. He, had, he could turn water into wine. He, had, he could make it unlimited fish. And in that respect, I think he is reflective of the communist ideal where all these goods just magically appear you know, at the, at the whim of bureaucrats and central planners who threaten force if people don't comply with their edicts. So I don't reconcile that with Jesus Christ at all. Jesus died for our sins. He showed kindness. Um, he healed. And, and he wasn't about the initiation of force. I mean, he, Jesus wouldn't have gone into politics and um so and and in, in american politics we don't want jesus involved i mean specifically we don't want jesus involved so you know i i find the whole thing of you know like some communist christian political ideology um incompatible certainly incompatible with my uh, libertarian uni unitarian universalist principles um, that it, it, you know, looks at the initiation of aggression and whether it comes through the state, you know, it's still the use of force and just war. I mean, that's, I, I just don't buy into that. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. I, Ethan, I've added you to the list. Uh, Karina, I'm, since you seem to be wanting to speak real quick after I want it, why don't you go next? Uh, oh, okay, okay. Here, here I am. It's Go just that, it's just one thing which kind of bothers me, and that was that Jesus said, "Those who live by the sword will die by the sword." And when Peter even tries to defend Jesus when Jesus is being arrested and cuts off the Roman soldier's ear. Jesus' action is well, reaction is one of horror. So, I mean, it's just my belief. How does Reverend Earp, uh, especially, reconcile those things with espousing, you know, revolution and bloodshed, even if necessary? Because I think, uh, my own opinion is that Jesus would have been more like a Martin Luther King figure of like civil disobedience, Gandhi resistance without violence, even to achieve quote unquote socialist goals and I'd like both of them to address this. Okay, is that it, Karina? Yep. All right. Ethan, since you uh, seem to be chomping at the bit, I'll let you go next. So you got three minutes. Uh go ahead and say your piece, Ethan. Okay. Hello everybody. Um I would like to share my screen. I think I can. You can. It's it should be open to everything. So go ahead, Ethan. On the bottom. Okay, let's see. Yeah, we can see um, it. Okay, I'd like to show everyone the meme that started all this on my Facebook wall. Uh, I posted this meme, and both Justin and Charlie replied, and we all went back and forth for a while. Um, just let everybody see this for a little bit. <laughs> oh. uh, and then um, I also yeah solid my... memes, man. You should do a meme slideshow for this uh, for the college, dude. I am. Of uh, I saw this one. <laughs> he also said, "Do not eat all the ice cream. I'll be back on Sunday." Ah, <laughs> where do you guys come up with this stuff? Uh, this one. Um, I think uh, it gets at the part of the heart of the debate that um, 
that if Jesus was a a statist communist, uh, he would be at the top left of the diagram. Um, but as a communalist, like the agrarian <laughs> uh, type, would be at the bottom left, uh, I believe. And um, Fox News would put him at the top far right, um, trying to impose a uh, that kind of view. And then I found this diagram, which explains how this one is. And um, that's it, really. Um, <laughs> I just thought uh, that would be now. How do I stop? Okay. I, I, so okay. I just I just thought would that would be good for some context and some laughs. Um, <laughs> and uh, to personally state my own religious beliefs, um, I uh, I decided that I'm a humanist because atheist seems silly to define yourself as something that you aren't or don't believe in. Define yourself as a negative. I think being a humanist. Um, Many atheists would call themselves humanists or secular humanists, uh, the term is used. And I think um, taking care of people is the right thing to do. I think socialism, um, at least in the Scandinavian model, is better than um, the very capitalist version that uh, America has been tending towards. And um, I think we just got to take care of people. I've, I've found myself uh, in many friendships with religious people, um, despite our disagreement on, on that one issue, because uh, we all do want to help people. Um, so that's why uh, I do get along sometimes with the libertarians and more often with the Green Party, um, uh, because we all should make the world a better place. And um, I think we can, and uh, I will leave it at that. Okay, Ethan, thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, sharing. Okay, Adam Bowling, why don't you go next there, sir? I'll give you three minutes. All right. Um, I will lower my hand. Thank you again, everyone who's participated, including in the lively chat. Uh, I had mentioned a few times before some of my questions about these interpretations that might hint at my own views. Uh, I'll admit I am a former Christian, uh, and also at one time when I was younger, more of a Marxist supporter, uh, and I'm now a disbeliever. Uh, so I didn't, and even though I'm a libertarian supporter and one of, you know, Justin's colleagues, I, you know, didn't exactly have a theological dog in this fight, so to speak. Um, as I suggested before in one of the comments I posted earlier, part of the problem I have with these discussions in general is that there's a certain amount of confirmation bias of modern people looking back upon religion for what the ancient sources for what they want to find. And as I suggested, some of those ancient sources, they are not eyewitness accounts. They're oral traditions at best written down sometimes 40 years after someone has died, sometimes centuries in the case of some of the Old Testament books after the events described, usually in response to something else that's happening later. Uh, so you look back on the story of the Pharaoh when you're dealing with a later empire that's invading and that sort of thing. Um, I don't have any faith in the supernatural miraculous. And I, at this point, don't have too much faith in the miraculous uh, utopian transformation of society. Uh, I guess I'm out of steam and out of hope about a lot of things in life in general. But it's made me skeptical of, uh, I think I use the term ventriloquism that sometimes goes on uh, in these discussions. And, you know, that we could play the game of, oh, no, you know, Jesus was more of a Chestertonian. Or Jesus was more of an anarcho syndicalist or he would have been a kibbutznik or any of a number of variations that are pretty far from. Oh, no, he would have been a Stalinist. No, he would have been a Trotskyist. No, he would have been would a Euro been a star. from the 1970s uh, and 80s. <laughs> I didn't quite hear what Kelvin said, but I like that guy. Rock star. Kelvin, let's a rock star. And, um, you know, I think it is a reminder to us how much of this wisdom is actually uh, human made. Um, wisdom or lack thereof. I don't think that ancient... Now, just because I'm a disbeliever, uh, doesn't mean that I think ancient culture should be off limits. You know, I read, I think people need to learn about the Iliad and the Odyssey too, but I don't take it devotionally. Uh, I don't give it tax exempt status. And I think there's sometimes a conflation of uh, 
like I'd also said earlier in the chat, sort of the, you know, Jesus as a sort of proto Gandhi versus Jesus as the red star. Uh, on the other hand, we've also had this from the right where this sort of radical notions from scripture have been used to prop up authority for centuries in the Christian West uh, and in empires governed by Christians around the world. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of grounds for humility. Uh, and I would say uh, cer certainly the ethical wisdom that we can take from our religious history, even as secular people like myself, you know, to watch out for infringing on one another's lives too much. But I don't see any easy answers coming out of any of this, uh, whether it's from the churches or from the secular spaces, because uh, in the end, we're going to be going on through life without a lot of reliable guidance from the world beyond and uh, without a net to catch us. Anyway, I guess I'm in a pessimistic mood, but uh, it was nice hearing from y'all. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, all right, I got a few, I'm gonna go back over. We got, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, six more. Kelvin, I got you. Dan Bader, I got you. G.H. Merritt, I got you. Austin, I got you. Emma, I got you. And then I got Charlie. Charlie usually likes to go last. Um, Kelvin, I'm gonna let you go next. Okay. Um, Got three minutes. All right. Firstly, I take umbrage with anybody that doesn't think that uh, Jesus was a political artist. Uh, anybody that's ever celebrated Passover with a Jewish family or a Jewish situation um, and gone through the story of Exodus and know the, 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 the ritual that goes on during Passover cannot negates the, the political nature of uh, Christ entering into Jerusalem upon an ass. <laughs> Sorry, an ass. All prophesied by, uh, so we ticked all the boxes of being a Messiah. Uh, and then he became not a political leader, but a spiritual one. Okay. Um, how... Christianity has been corrupted. When I said scum, I didn't mean that as a, a derogatory term. I meant that as a, like an engineering term. It's what rises. It's what. It's the end results. What's on the top, uh, and how uh, how things work out. When you have communism, was a lovely ideal, and you end up with Stalinism, and you end up with that totalitarian oppressive regime. That's still is the same totalitarian oppressive regime under Christianity. And you still have the uh, uh, violence, the xenophobia, the, the, the tribalism. Um, <sighs> Jesus was not a communist because the Good Samaritan had money. He had money to sort out the other guy. He had money to pull him up in a hotel. He did not campaign as a communist or a socialist might for better policing in the area, maybe walking caravans between Jericho and Jerusalem so people would not get attacked. He didn't do that. He was a moralist. The Good Samaritan, great story. And I think there's another one where uh, fruit pickers ended up getting paid less because they worked all day, but that was a part of their contract and stuff like that. that was, that's one I've been recently told. I didn't ever actually let that one. Um, also, you also remember when Jesus said it's, it's easier for a rich man to pass through the eye of a needle, the chances are that the rich man was a slave owner. Slavery was quite, it was, you know, if you were rich, you had slaves. How could you own slaves and be a Christian? I, I understand that anything to the left of Genghis Khan is viewed as communism in America, but um, there are other degrees of revolution and there are other degrees of altruism other than communism and socialism. Okay. Just because 
Just because somebody's altruistic or uh, does not mean that they're communist or socialist. Doesn't mean they want to alter society. Just means okay. we should be better to each other. And that's what Jesus said. We should be better to each other. Okay, Kelvin, I'm going to have to cut you off there because of time. Well, I'm finished anyway. All right. Thank you very much. Dan, you already went once, but let's try to make it quick, okay? So please, uh, I'll get you next, Dan. You want me to go now? Yes, if you don't uh, mind. Yeah, okay. I, I, well, just, just a few thoughts. Uh, you know, I, I always understood the God of the Old Testament to be pretty much a straightforward tribal God. Didn't seem to be uh, uh, any confusion about that. And I see the uh, idea whether you know you believe that it actually went down this way or not, of uh, Jesus as being a manifestation of God. It's actually, uh, a, I think, a, a easy to understand improvement because Jesus ended up sacrificing himself for the good of the community, in a sense for humanity. And that was a very altruistic act that was performed. And so, you know, from a role modeling point of view, it was a real improvement to kind of the idea that, you know, you have your tribal enemies, and if necessary, you're going to exterminate them and take their resources. So, uh, you know, I, I do see it that way. I think also, you know, in terms of communism, uh, Communism is also kind of focused on a, a lot of things, but one of the things is that uh, the group, the welfare, the benefit of the group takes precedence over the selfishness or greed or you know, sinful nature of the individual human. And, and uh, you know, so I, I can kind of see that there. But I think that uh, with, with, with religion, organized religion, what tends to happen, and, and I do personally, I really believe that uh, tribalism is part of our hardwired human nature, however you want to take, you know, however that is understood. And, and there's a danger with all of these organized religions, and I think history shows it. And you can say the same thing about communism, which emphasizes the group over the individual, uh, once it becomes tribalistic and uh, anything, uh, particularly when you have a belief in heaven and hell, and if you don't follow the tribal rules or the religious rules, you might end up in hell. And there, therefore, uh, it becomes a, a big issue when you have rival religions tending to lead uh, your flock or your group astray where they could possibly end up in hell. Anyway, uh, I want to thank the presenters. You know, I, I, uh, uh, I think the uh, uh, topics brought up were, were of interest. Thank you. No problem. Okay. okay. Miss uh, G.H. Merritt, please, you're next. If you'd like to go, you got three minutes and I'd like to hear from you, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, speaking because Justin asked me to because he knows I used to live in a Christian commune. Um, but um, yeah, my husband and I, uh, we were hippies and we were part of the Jesus movement um, a long time ago. And we lived in a couple of different Christian communes and we were um, interacting for many years with uh, and to this day with people that lived in our Christian houses. As, as well as others in the area. And um, one thing I would like to say is that um, I feel like Jesus transcends um, capitalism and communism. Uh, I, I have a lot of uh, uh, agreement with T Tim about the way uh, he looks at Jesus and Christianity. Um, but I think that we have a personal relationship with him and in the gospel so they they talk about um the the spiritual aspect of it as well as you know caring for the poor 
And but that is to be a fruit of your relationship with him. And so um, so so that's how we looked at it then. That's how we look at it now. And um, I also wanted to mention to Kelly um, regarding uh, slavery. Uh, I would encourage you to check out the book of Philemon. Uh, Philemon was a runaway slave and he later became a bishop in the early church. And so you might find his story interesting. But right. Anyway, so, so that, that's how, how I look at it. It's, it's a much more in a spiritual and um, apologies to, to Adam, supernatural um, uh, mm. context as well. But right. Jesus condoned slaves. Uh, Pardon? Jesus condoned slavery. Calvin, Calvin, let's. So uh, we got other people. No, okay. I don't think Jesus condoned slavery. It was yeah. part of their that culture. It was part of all cultures, really. So. Yeah, yeah. But so, we so, did, so we, was both sides and prawns, but he had no problem with uh, condemning that. All right, Calvin, let's. Uh, we got Please. Two. Okay. Uh, Austin or Emma, which one would you would like to go next? Okay, Austin, why don't you go ahead and go next? Austin Vogel, please. Got three minutes, and I appreciate you coming in. Emma, you'll be up after him. Okay, um, I joined a little bit late, so I missed like the first half of this. Um, but from what I gathered, from what I've seen, um, personally, I just believe Jesus would not force anything from anybody else. I don't think that um, that would be something he would do. We can all take care of each other without government intervention. Um, I think that your relationship with God is a personal one. It doesn't involve any sort of government, communism, democracy, et cetera. Um, and I have a lot, I agree a lot actually with Kelvin and with Adam with what they had to say. Um, but that's about all I have to say. Okay, Austin, we appreciate you contributing tonight. Uh, thank you very, very much. Okay, you. Emma, you're all set. Uh, you got three minutes and uh, I'd love to hear from you, please. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Um. <clears throat> So, you know, Jesus was a narrative. I mean, the Gospels are a narrative. And so basically the Gospels are checks. That's the only thing we really know about them is that they're checks that was written by somebody. And then over time, the text got picked up and it got turned into a religion. So that's what we know about the checks. And the text itself definitely has a strong pull towards social justice and towards human rights and toward the idea of some kind of addressing of liberation of the poor. I think the most interesting statement that was made today was made by the advocate for Jesus was a communist, which was that it didn't matter whether it existed or not, what did matter is the faith of the people who followed the chat. And I think in a lot of ways, you can say the same thing about communism. I mean, <clears throat> I think it's pretty clear that communism, at least as it was practiced in the 20th century, was a failed political ideology. But what communism meant to the people who had their quote unquote faith in communism was what shaped it. And so regardless of what communism is, it's become a significant and influential factor in global politics. Um, you know, I mean, we have the largest nation on earth, which actually calls itself a communist country, even though it's actually a mixture of communism and capitalism. Christianity is, um, you know, a pretty significant cultural force. So I'll give it that. I don't believe that Jesus Christ existed. I believe in Joseph Atwell's theory, I think it's brilliant scholarship, that Jesus was a creation of the Flavian Empire, and it was meant to suppress a 
similar style Masada Rebellion because the Baruch Masada Rebellion had been such a thorn in the side of the Romans, the Roman occupying empire in Judea. So it was very interesting listening to both of our speakers. I really do appreciate it. And um, I think probably, yes, Jesus would be a comment. Where are you heading to, uh, Emma? I noticed you're driving. Uh, so. Oh, yeah, I'm just done with my day. I'm just going home. Yeah, it just uh, looks interesting. Thank you, Emma, very much. All right, yeah. Charlie, I guess you're up next. So go ahead. All right. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank both our speakers for a job well done. I'll be eclectic as usual. I have six points to cover. One, uh, I spent many years in the search of the historical Jesus academically. Uh, he, Jesus is a composite of about 18 different individuals, 18. And that's per the uh, scholarly research. Uh, Christianity is really the church of Paul, the Reverend hit on that. Um, Jesus was clearly an activist. He was an organizer in many respects. He had the attributes of a revolutionary. He uh, assembled the masses uh, in public uh, areas. Um, and he basically challenged the values of the day. Uh, if anything is like an organizing, the unions have an organizing department. Jesus would have fit right in there really quite well. Um, Another thing is, uh, he might have had some difficulty. Uh, for some reason, there's another topic, religions are inherently conservative, and they would not possibly embrace Jesus. He ran into issues like that in his own day, uh, and they aligned themselves with the powers that be, basically the state. So he would have run into problems like that. This notion that the, the government is forced, which the libertarians it is a terrible concept. Uh, take from the rich, give to the poor, and be a Christian. And drop this nonsense. These people are in need. They have very legitimate, real needs. And do whatever it is to alleviate those needs. It's called social justice. And I guess if you're in favor of justice, then that's what needs to be done. Uh, it's called being the other thing about Christianity is that uh, I've often been amazed, why is there not a commandment that says, thou shalt not have slaves? Now, Tim, you think it's a wonderful inerrancy of the gospels. Why do they have a commandment like that? Or one, thou shalt not torture. <laughs> well, uh, how about thou shalt not mistreat your neighbor? Uh, anyhow, now the last thing I wanna talk about um, is mistaken many people we heard about episodes of Jesus. He gathered 5,000 people together and was lecturing them. And then at the end of the day, they wanted to have dinner. Now, to show that he was something of a communist was that most people mistakenly don't know this event was not like they multiplied the loaves and fishes. That's not what happened. What really happened was, was that the people there shared what food that they each of them had. That was the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And that's what Jesus was up to. And if anything defines his message, that event alone, uh, I would say, uh, defines uh, uh, what he was trying to convey to people and seems to be missed on a number of people. Anyhow, again, thank both the speaker and all the questioners and rebuttals. Hope you enjoyed the college. See you again. Okay, uh, we got our two debaters ready to make closing remarks. Who wants to go first, Charlie or uh, Justin, for final remarks? I invite Justin to go first. Okay, right. Justin. So <clears throat> I can I can respect Reverend Arp for wanting to reclaim the word communist and, and make it a different definition away from the Soviet Union. I'm trying to do that myself with the word liberal. I used to have a AM talk radio understanding of the word liberal, which was just basically 
an ins you know like an insult to like people who weren't conservatives basically um and and um I have to call the you know this was a great conversation I I, I uh I really enjoyed what a lot of uh Reverend Arp had to say um um but I have to call him out on his whataboutism. Uh, he uh, did. He did do a uh, you know talk about the you know the evils of the Soviet Union. Well, what about the evils of the United States? Um, that's not really an argument against communism, uh, and that's okay. You know, uh, sometimes we just forget that we do whataboutisms and. It could happen to anyone. Um, I think the United States has does a lot to alleviate poverty, at least if we're talking about uh, social programs. In fact, I mentioned, uh, I read, you know, the planks of the Communist Manifesto. I feel we've come very, very, very close to, you know, implementing most of that um <laughs> as i he uh reverend arp mentioned uh environmentalism earlier and you know libertarians uh or capitalists um i try my best to do to be green i i i like i said i take the cta um i don't have children yet um you know, I, I, uh, I, you know, I try not to waste as, as much, you know, I try not to waste anything and I try to recycle, you know, um, I think that there are laws that should be necessary from a libertarian perspective based on protecting property that, uh, that also protect the environment. Um, pollution is trespassing, and it's theft of our it's theft of our clean resources. Um, I wanted to mention uh, slavery. Um, yeah, slavery has been a huge part of our culture until you know. The, the 19th century. Um, and Paul, you know, told us how slaves should act, you know, in his epistles. And that unfortunately has become scripture. Um, but as, as you know, the, the main abolitionists in the United States who were, who were, you know, wanting to abolish slavery did so driven by their Christian faith, John Brown on one extreme. And then, uh, is it Harriet Beecher Stowe that wrote, uh, uncle Tom's cabin, um, you know, battle hymn of the Republic is, uh, is a, you know, like a, it's a war Christian war song trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. It's, it's uh, got, it's, there's a lot there. Um, and I think that because Christians have, are taking love your neighbor as yourself to as, as far extremes as they can go. That is why culture nowadays is intolerable to slavery <clears throat> and we try to use government to protect our, you know the, our uh, one of the the purported purposes of government is to protect our rights and i think that a lot of that is informed by the christian heritage um i i, I one of the one of the things i wanted to mention since we were talking about Christian communities is Labrie. I don't know if uh, me and GH have talked about Labrie before, but uh, 
Labrie uh, is a very interesting uh, thing. It was basically like hippies uh, backpacking around Europe. They'd stay at Labrie. It was in Switzerland and was ran by Francis Schaefer. And uh, Francis Schaefer, you know, he, you, you come and you work in the uh, little house, whatever you call it, that, that are on the mountains. And you learn, you study the Bible and you study other philosophy and come and go. And then on Sundays, I guess he preached. I would love to have gone to Labrie and have seen Francis Schaefer in action. Um, it seems like a very crazy place in a moment of time that uh, I'm kind of envious that GH got the kind of experience. So, uh, yeah. I agree with also a lot of what GH had to say about Jesus transcending communism and, and capitalism. Um, that's why I, I did not argue that Jesus was a libertarian. That's why I did not argue that Jesus was a capitalist. Um, but I think that I could, I'm really interested in read. I, I did quote Robert Sirico, Father Robert Sirico, in my presentation. He just has a new book out called, uh, it's called um, The Economics of the Parables, which maybe I can come and do a report on for the college as I kind of did with another Robert Sirico book back when we talked to, when I did a talk about Scrooge. Um, and I'll end with this. Uh, and th let's ask me, let's, let's get one more question, I think, from uh, the presenter. So my last question to Charlie is this, Reverend Art. Um, how do you feel about decentralization as a principle? Um, for example, you know, you probably think Cook County, city of Chicago can be, do even more, be even more progressive do more things, more, more sort of progressive and socialistic measures. Do you think that decentralization where say like Cook County become its own state uh, could be a means to bring about maybe some of the political reforms that even you would probably like to see implemented? And that is all I have to say. Thanks, guys, for, for, for joining us. And I appreciate everybody coming here. LPIllinois.org. Click on that donate button, please. Thank you. Now, uh, um, our Reverend Shirley, you got your, now your turn for the last word. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've been sitting here, I'm like, is there anything I can say that hasn't been said? Is there an issue I can address? And I keep coming back to why did I, how did this happen? How did a Pentecostal preacher's kid become a Marxist? It just seems unfathomable. I remember when I went to summer camp, a Pentecostal summer camp, and Pentecostal summer camp is fun. We praise the Lord. We roll in the aisles. We speak in tongues. They did all that stuff. And we were talking to a college choir, a college age choir. And one of the kids, we were a bunch of kids, we were probably junior high or pre-junior high. One of the kids in this, listening to this college choir that had sung really beautifully during our uh, summer camp. Uh, one of the kids says, what do you think about communism? And I didn't really know what the word meant at this point. And one of the women in this college choir, you know, so she was just a college student said, oh, communism is a beautiful idea, but human beings are too simple. I'm a, you know, I'm like a nine, 10, maybe 11 year old Pentecostal preacher's kid hearing that communism is a beautiful idea, but humans are too simple. And what I thought in my head is, if it's really a beautiful idea, Jesus would want it. And I don't know, from there, I, I began to believe somehow that this crazy world and this was the this was the vietnam era vietnam ended in 75 and i was 12 years old when the vietnam war ended and this is the era when there was a lot of race riots and this is the era when there was you know i wanted shirley chisholm to become president not richard nixon um and i was only 
I was only 10 years old when, when um, Shirley Chisholm ran. Actually, I was only nine years, it was 60, sorry, 72. So I was only nine years old when Shirley Chisholm ran for president. I wanted her to win badly because um, I thought racial justice demanded it. And I was a nine-year-old kid. I, and when I was a teenager, I ran across the Jesus People USA. It's a commune on the north side of Chicago and uptown. They passing out rock and roll music, which I love their music. I love their newsletter. And they talked about the fact that they live communally. And I said, wait a minute, that's in the Bible. Every Christian should live communally. And so I did when I was in my 20s. My wife and I and my baby daughter moved to live in a commune, Reba Place Fellowship. And from there, I discovered, liber well, actually, not, not long before I came to Reba, I discovered liberation theology, which was using Marxism and Christian orthodoxy, Catholic Christian orthodoxy, to come up with a new theology that centered the liberation of the poor. And I said, that sounds like Jesus. That sounds like Moses. I want to be a liberation theologian. I want to be a communist, an anarcho-communist. That's how I started. Life intervened and I couldn't, I could no longer say that I thought the state had no role. I said, you know, the state gave me food stamps. The state gave me a free education. The state gave me things. I don't think the state is the problem anymore. I think it's capitalism. And thus I became a Marxist. But all along it was Jesus. Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do it unto me and that the nations that do not feed the poor will be destroyed utterly. And that's what I believe. I, I'm going to summarize myself. I'm sorry if I'm running a little over, but I'm going to summarize my beliefs. I sort of a creed, as it were, that I have. And this is on my Twitter account, if you want to look at it. I published this April 28th on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Kami Preacher, but it's also Charlie1963 with a Y. I spell Charlie with a Y. I believe in a world without warfare. Sorry, I believe in a world without poverty, and I believe in a world with sustainable abundance. I believe in a world without warfare. I believe in a world of global peace. I believe in a world without white supremacy, and I believe in a world of creative interracial communalism. I believe in a world without ecocide. I believe in a world with flourishing ecosystems. I believe in a world without tyranny. I believe in a world with liberation power sharing. I believe in a world without transphobia, I believe in a world of gender heterogeneity. I believe in a world without religious fascism. And I believe in a world of universalist convergence. And only if we achieve all of these can we say we have brought into being the kingdom of heaven, which Jesus commands us to pray for it to come on earth. Never mind what you're supposed to do with your afterlife. Call, pray for the kingdom of heaven on earth. Only that can be called what I call the communism of love. And I'm going to stick my, my uh, link tree up here one more time. Please support me. I'm writing a book and I'm doing some online ministry. I've got a YouTube channel. Please check it out. And uh, I'm doing this because I, I see too much suffering in the world. I saw children starving to death on my TV as a little kid. And I said, Jesus, that hurts Jesus. Every child that starves to death is hurting God. And we need to stop it. And that's, in a certain way, that's how it all began, with a simple belief that poverty was against the will of God. And I'm done. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, we're going to cut out of here in a minute or two. We'll keep the lines open for chat. And uh, I'll just simply say this. Everybody, you know what it's all about. And, uh, and of course... All right, Tim, we don't need this. <laughs> the college Just is now adjourned. It. All right, I'm going to um, stop the recording.